the action begins in an ordinary high school in Japan. The main character, Hidaka Masamune, is sitting alone at his desk, scared. Two of his classmates approach him, and one of them with an earring in his ear, leaning on him, puts his hand on his shoulder. They rudely ask Hidaka to go to them for juice. The young man, holding a notebook in his hands, agrees and clarifies whether they should take seltzer juice. But at this moment he thinks that he is being used every day as an errand boy. The guys throw a couple of coins into his palm so that he buys them a few packs of juice. Hidaka reflects that all this is happening simply because he was cursed by the servant personality. He has already come to terms with the fact that the sky is constantly gray and gloomy for him. He considers it his daily life. The girl approaches a group of guys who send Hidaka for juice. She asks them if they continue to mock Haidai Kun. The girl with glasses begins to shame the guys, saying that they are already in high school but they continue to behave like bullies. One of the young men replies that he will just buy them juice and asks what the problem is. The hooligans approach the frightened Hidaka from behind, and the boy with the earring in his ear says that they are old friends and asks if this is true. While Hidaka was silent, the other guy replied that it was true and Kawashi-sen just made a mistake. The girl asks in surprise if this is true, not believing their words. Hidaka agrees with the hooligans' words, assuring his classmate that she shouldn't worry about him. Kawashi doesn't quite believe his words and decides to clarify once again whether everything is alright with him. The young man looks up and looks at her. Then he looks away and says he doesn't understand what she's talking about. He walks out of the classroom and leaves the confused girl behind. Hidaka believes that there are only four types of people who participate in bullying, and each of them has their own role in this. He divides them into observers, assistants, bullies and victims. He goes out on the roof and thinks that in fact they all like the fact that they were not at the victim's place. Hidaka walks to the edge of the roof and puts his hands on the railing. He thinks he's broken. He climbs over the railing and standing on the very edge says out loud that it is not really him who is broken, but this world. Hidaka says goodbye. He intends to finally end his life. During his fall, he thinks that it was not necessary to take his own life, but he was unable to continue to exist in this way. Introducing his classmates, he thinks that they probably won't even notice that he's not there. Hidaka falls and it is announced that Hidaka Masamune has died. The young man opens his eyes and looks at what is happening with amazement. He stands in the middle of a huge hall opposite the throne on which a man sits majestically. On both sides of him there are people who joyfully inform his majesty that they have succeeded, and they finally manage to do something. Hidaka wonders if he is alive and where he ended up. The man sitting on the throne greets the heroes. He expresses his joy that they have finally arrived to them. Hidaka does not understand which heroes are in question, and what the man meant by saying this. Hidaka notices that his entire class is standing behind him. The man says that his name is Johannes Greyberg, and he is the 47th king of the state Greyberg. Hidaka turns back and asks himself why the whole class was moved here. The king expresses regret that he had to summon them all so unexpectedly. The young man catches the look of the guy who treated him badly, and being afraid of him, turns away. His majesty says that the kingdom of Greyberg has been at war with magical entities for many years, but they still do not know when this war will come to an end and because of this they decided to summon heroes to help them in this desperate situation. The king says that the message says that the summoned heroes will have high characteristics and skills. He is about to continue his speech, but someone interrupts him with a loud shout demanding to stop his story. The young man who mocked Hidaka declares that he will not do anything. He rudely asks what characteristics we are talking about. Then he turns to the king and asks if he understands that he has kidnapped them all. Right near these legs of the young man there is a small explosion, which did not touch and did not hurt the guy in any way, but scared him very much. The king, with his hand outstretched in front of him, from which smoke is coming, announces that he has used magic. He apologizes for acting so unexpectedly. The whole class was very scared of the explosion. And King Greyberg justifies himself by saying that it is quite difficult for people who do not believe in magic to explain it. The king continues his apologies and says that visually showing magic is more effective. The young man who was arguing with the king was very angry at his act. Another classmate with a mole under his eye calls him by his name, Sai, and he turns around and asks in a sharp form why he called him. He replies that they are surrounded by an armed guard of warriors, so it's better not to start a fight with the king. He offers to listen to them, since no one understands what is happening at the moment. Two girls express their agreement with the words of their classmate and ask Sai to be quiet for a while. Sai agrees with extreme dissatisfaction. The king says that they can relax, since they are not going to kill the heroes they spent so much effort to summon. 
He adds that it was extremely difficult to summon them. Sai exclaims that they are all just high school students. His Majesty replies that after their summoning, each of them received a unique strength and profession, and those who received the title of hero are especially talented. The girl with long hair says that they will understand everything if they say the word status. Sai speaks and a panel of his characteristics appears. There he reads that his full name is Siki Keita. He is a sage of the first level, and he has the title of a hero, and the magic skill is a fire hammer. The girl is surprised. She informs the king that there is great news, this boy is a sage. She adds that the sage is the highest class of knight, and he also has a sacred attribute. The girl turns to the king and says that she never ceases to be surprised by what is happening. Idaka turns around in confusion. Someone shouts that the boy is a hero. The king and the knights are surprised to hear these words. The girl tells the guy with the mole that his characteristics are incomparable. The panel says that his name is Akijo Yakamura and he is a first-level hero with many strong magical skills and also has a hero's sword. Hidaka is terrified. He thinks it's all some kind of madness. He thinks to himself that all these people were happy initially, and now they have the opportunity to be happy even in another world. He reflects that there is also something and quietly, almost in a whisper, pronounces the word status. On the panel, he sees that his profession is a healer, and his title is reborn and his indicators are quite low compared to others. Hidaka looks at the panel, sees his title, profession and gets angry. He asks with hatred if this is his blessing. Nervous, Hidaka asks the girl to tell him something. She politely asks him what exactly he wants to know. The girl smiles affably, but when he clarifies what the healer is doing, she instantly changes her face. She replies that healers are a profession specializing in treatment, adding that this is the weakest class and Hidaka feels very disappointed not believing what he has heard that he is the weakest. Siki approaches him and asks if he has heard it. He loudly says that Hidaka is the weakest, and wonders why he appeared here at all. The girl with glasses calls him, calling him Saki-kun and angrily wants to say something. But he immediately interrupts her. Siki says she can't refute the fact that he's the most useless here. Ikijo turns to Siki and tells him that he has gone too far this time. He asks if he thinks that he was too rude to Hidaka. The young man boldly clarifies whether he is telling him this. A short elderly man approached Hidaka and asked if he could ask why it was written only in his title that he was reborn. The whole class turned around, waiting for an answer. Hidaka begins to answer reluctantly. At this time, the girl looks at him with contempt in her eyes. Hidaka, looking away, admits that he jumped off the roof. The old man replies that he understands him. The girl invites everyone to talk about their future. She says that the first thing they will be enrolled in a special school. She informs them that they will focus there on training their strength so that they can fight against magical entities. The girl asks everyone to stand in a circle to teleport them to the student dormitory. Hidaka, having turned away from everyone, thinks that he could not continue like this anymore, and that is why he ended his life. Siki says that Hidaka has remained unnecessary, even after everything that happened to them, although being a healer is better than being unemployed. Hidaka continues to reflect and thinks that even so, he is still in his cruel everyday life. Siki says that in any case, no one will remember him. Hidaka thinks to himself that even in another world everything is the same way. Hidaka thinks that even in this world he continues to treat him badly. When Siki is already walking away, he wonders if it's really that much fun. He turns around and asks again. He approaches Hidaka and asks what he just said. Hidaka replies that it doesn't matter and he is already sick of Siki and he abruptly grabs him by the collar. Hidaka declares that he will not go anywhere. The girl asks again in surprise. The girl clarifies whether this is true. She says that when she found out that he was a healer, she thought about taking him to a different place from his classmates. He is surprised to hear about another place. She says the teleportation point is chosen randomly, so they wouldn't be able to predict exactly where he would go. She says that they call her a security system and they can always count on her support. Hidaka thanks for the security system but she replies that he misunderstood her words. The girl says that this system is intended only for them, and it will help only them. She shouts loudly that this magical tool is designed specifically to save their people. She is angry that they used him to summon powerful heroes, and summoned him, a useless healer. In a rage, she asks how they can entrust the safety of their people to someone like him. Siki approaches him from behind and asks if he sees that he has remained a pathetic person even after all this. The girl screams that he has committed an unforgivable sin having spent their strength and hope, and that he will pay for it with his life. Hidaka is angry and thinks why he is always the one. He furiously declares that he will destroy them and this whole country. He promises that he will destroy everything, that not even a speck of dust will remain. 
Siki looks with disdain, and others with surprise when Hidaka shouts with hatred that he will kill every one of them, absolutely all of them. He walks alone, in pitch darkness, and asks himself how long he has been wandering and where he is at all now. He calls up his characteristics panel with the word status and examines it, calling himself weak. Then he notices that he has a status where it is written that he has an obsession with another world and this disorder is caused by longing for another world. Hidaka grins and asks if it turns out that he is sick. Hidaka finds three chests, and suspicions creep in that it may be a mimic. He reflects on how long he has been walking and the young man is upset by the fact that during all this time he could only find a torch and get to this dark room with chests. He opens the first chest, and it turns out to be completely empty. He says he will check the other one and opens it. Seeing some kind of thing there, he realizes that it is a small bottle with liquid inside. He picks it up and suggests that there may be some magic potion in this little bottle. Suddenly, he hears someone's loud voice telling him to drink it. He turns around in fright and asks who is here. He is answered from the darkness that if he craves killing power, then he needs to drink it. Hidaka asks what he is talking about and is told to just drink the contents. He looks at the bottle and wonders if this whole story is a hallucination. He remembers the girl and Siki who called him useless. He clutches the potion in his hand and thinks that if he drinks it, he can get the desired power. He reflects that he has thought more than once that if he gets into another world, he wants to start life from scratch. He opens the potion and drinks, thinking that in this world he still has a chance. He decides to try and completely drinks the contents. The bottle falls to the floor and breaks into small pieces. He believes that surviving in a deadly maze is an incredible miracle, and in any case, betting on a mysterious bottle is better than just saying goodbye to your life. The action takes place in the National Academy of the Ares Kingdom, in the Kingdom of Greyburg. Students walk around the student dormitory and have a conversation with each other. Someone mentions that they think Ares-san is very cute. The girl with glasses is perplexed and asks if they have seen her terrible face. Siki replies that beautiful flowers usually come with thorns. Akijo says that these are not thorns and she really had a thirst for murder coming from her. He asks if they will see Hidaka again. He asks Siki if he really likes it. Siki asks him again, and Akijo tells him not to pretend, and it's about Hidaka. Siki dismissively notes that Akijo is too kind to him and tells him to stop with it, because he is tired of these conversations. Kawashi suddenly decides to mention Kid. She says she was silent for a long time, but Siki and Kida always treated Hidaka badly. The guys deny Kawashi's words, they say they didn't do any of this. Siki tells them not to touch Kidu and that there is nothing they can do to help. He claims that even though they blame them, Hidaka will never come back anyway. Siki assumes that he is already dead now. At this time, Hidaka is lying unconscious in a dark room with chests. He wakes up and realizes that most likely it was a faint. He says that despite the severe pain, he does not feel any changes in himself. He wonders if it's always been so bright here or if it's the effect of the liquid he drank. He throws the torch and says that the price for this was the unbearable pain he is experiencing at this moment. He notices that there is still one chest that he has not opened, and, opening it, he thinks about what the result will be this time. However, suddenly this chest turns into a huge monster with big, sharp teeth and attacks Hidaka. The young man does not have time to escape, and the monster severely wounds him. Hidaka screams loudly from the incredible pain that he is experiencing at this moment. The monster bit off part of his arm. The creature is standing in front of him and is going to attack him again. Hidaka runs away screaming and the monster does not follow him, but turns back into an ordinary chest. Hidaka, hiding somewhere, is trying with all his might to heal his wounded arm. He swears, because he guessed that it was a mimic. His health dropped to 42 out of 60, and his mana to 38 out of 50. He says healing doesn't work and calls himself the weakest class. He begins to realize that he will not be able to defeat such a monster, but his hand begins to heal. Hidaka looks at the panel where it says that he has received a unique skill with the title Blessing of the Goddess, Divine Revenge. This skill was obtained through the use of the secret medicine god of revenge and includes the skill Reverse Pull. Hidaka wonders if that thing is a secret medicine. He reads on the panel that the reverse effect can arbitrarily set the status to any object and can be cancelled, but when the status is cancelled, the polarity sign immediately changes to the opposite. An alert is issued that the launch of Divine Revenge activates reverse, but at the same time healing is replaced by Wave of Erosion. Hidaka is outraged why so loudly and does not understand what erosion means. The panel says that the erosion wave is a spherical wave with an erosion effect, radiates around the user and takes the life of the one it touches, and the range of the effect can be expanded due to the distribution of magical power. 
Hidaka sits and reads his panel. He wonders if the healing has really turned into a saving wave of erosions. He thinks he might be able to defeat this monster and he goes back to the chest. He understands that the chest is in the same place and it will not move until someone tries to open it. His hands are still shaking, although he has returned his left hand to a functioning position. He worries and hopes that he will die. He uses an erosion wave and it's coming at the monster. Hidaka overcomes the monster thanks to a new skill. There is a small explosion, and he notes that this is how the reverse works. He shouts joyfully that he has won. It turns out that the notification that the blessing of the goddess is activated and he is asked to choose a loot. Hidaka wonders what the blessing of the goddess is because he did not use it. He's wondering if he can get his loot. On the panel, he reads about the new skill mimicry, which makes it possible to change his appearance. It also says about the skill royal arc, which is a space intended for storage, and the potion small recovery. He believes that the royal arc will also definitely be useful to him and thinks that there was a lot of useful things in it for a simple box. A notification is issued that the mimic was of the 500th level and was a guardian. Hidaka is surprised that the monster was so strong. Notification of a level increase comes in huge numbers. The alerts keep coming, and he's thinking about how long this will last. One of the alerts says that the level of healing has been increased by increasing the user's level. Hidaka is surprised that there are levels in Magic 2. His healing skill has increased. Notifications come in huge numbers, which is extremely annoying to Hidaka. Hidaka examines the panel with his characteristic and is surprised by his indicators. His level, skills and abilities have grown significantly. The young man, reading the panel, says that since he does not know the standards of this world, he cannot be sure that with such a level one can call himself strong. He remembers his classmates and is afraid that they can all significantly surpass him in strength. The young man, looking into the dark corridor, decides that it's time for him to continue on his way. After walking through it, he finds himself near a mysterious, large gate. He assumes that an event is waiting for him behind these gates and without hesitation tries to open them. However, the doors cannot be opened on their own, and he wonders how he can get in there. He suddenly comes up with an idea of how to do this. He decides to use his magic skill, a wave of erosion and makes a big round hole in the gate. He concludes that it is not necessary to do everything in an honest way. Hidaka, entering the spacious hall, is surprised. He sees a levitating rod in front of him. Overjoyed, he runs to the rod and says that he has been waiting for so long when he finally gets some equipment. He runs up, but when he tries to grab the rod, a strong earthquake suddenly begins. He is at a loss. The only thing he can understand now is that the room is shaking violently. Hidaka hears a loud knock from above. He raises his head and sees that the ceiling has given a huge crack and continues to break. The ceiling finally collapses, and something falls to the floor with a loud crash, causing Hidaka to be genuinely horrified. A giant in knight's armor appears right in front of the young man and swings at him with his huge sword. Hidaka doesn't believe it could be the guardian of that wand. The sword almost grazed him, but at the last moment Hidaka manages to dodge. The guardian hits the floor with his sword with such force that it shatters into splinters that fly into Hidaka. The young man realizes that the guardian is too strong, but he thinks that he will be able to overcome him since his physical resistance has increased significantly. Hidaka uses a protective aura and sees that the giant has hit the floor with his sword with such force that he cannot pull it out. The young man understands that this is his chance to defeat the enemy and attacks with magic. He hits the guardian and severely injures him. The knight falls to his knees from the wound received. The young man thinks that he has already defeated his opponent. He is surprised and rejoices that it was much easier than he thought. But the guardian gets to his feet and suddenly hits Hidaka with such force that he flies off against the wall so that it cracks. The knight has risen and the young man wonders why. He thought he had already defeated him. Hidaka begins to heal himself and reflects that if he had not used a protective aura, then everything could have been much worse. He realizes that he has become overconfident after leveling up, even though he is only a healer. Thinking about what to do, he decides that it's time to show all his might. He, using all his remaining strength, attacks the enemy and his attack is much stronger than last time. His blow strikes the knight to death. Hidaka realizes that this is the end and the guardian instantly evaporates. There are notifications about receiving a new item namely the sword of the senior knight and increasing skills, where it is said that the mimic style allows you to hide your status at a higher level. Hidaka is surprised that it can work this way as well. The young man examines the panel and realizes that he is already 212th level. He says that despite his level, his magic has the lowest level, the fifth. 
He remembers the girl who contemptuously called him the weakest class and denies her words in his head, thinking that they will see that this is not so at all. The notification says that he received a new magic item Saint's Wrath with the holy attribute Saint's Light. Hidaka holds it in his hands and examines it carefully. He reads in the notification that it is a magic item and rejoices. He is sure that someday he will definitely need it. The action unfolds in the National Academy of the Kingdom of Ares on the training ground number one. The exhausted young man falls to the floor. The teacher is interested in his well-being, and the boy replies that he is fine. The teacher says that his magic circle is not stable and requires concentration. Teacher Philip Butler claims that the magic of the boy's explosion is very strong, so much so that it is very difficult to cope with it. But he must learn to use it without the help of singing or a magic circle. Philip adds that if he can't do it, he won't be able to defeat even the most ordinary demon. He tells the young man that it is his duty to be a hero, and the boy agrees. Sitting under a tree, Siki and his companion are closely watching the scene. Siki frustratedly claims that they lack magical power. His interlocutor, not having heard him, asks again, and the young man repeats, asking what then is the use of their magic. Siki says that in the end, only one boy out of all of them can use his magic. His friend replies that he now understands why he is thinking about this guy. He tells Siki that they are just scenery, and being a hero and being called him are different concepts, and there's nothing you can do about it. Siki is extremely disappointed by this fact, but agrees with his friend's words. Hidaka is drinking something hard. He walks down the corridor with a bottle in his hands and says that even though he drinks for the first time in his life, he thinks that this sake was just great. He believes that he is very lucky, because he stumbled upon a grocery warehouse, so the problem with food is solved at the moment. He sees a big door and thinks about going in there. He opens the door, looks inside and hears someone say that he got here. On the throne in front of him sits a man with pointed ears and greets Hidaka, calling him an adventurer. Hidaka does not understand what is happening, and stands in amazement. He thinks about where he is and that the atmosphere here feels very different. A man asks a strange magical creature, similar to a flying eye named Zuri, how many years have passed since an adventurer last visited him. The creature with one eye, tail and bat wings replies that it has already been about 150 years. The man thinks and is surprised by the fact that so much time has passed since then. He gets up from the throne and exclaims that today is their holiday. He goes towards Hidaki and says that he is Sheon, the snake king, and calls the young man to start. He approaches Hidaka and offers to fight. At this moment Hidaka feels something in his stomach. He lets go of his gaze to look. The Snake King pierced his stomach with a sword and exclaimed that he finally remembered this feeling. He pulls out his sword and, laughing angrily, repeats that this is the most wonderful feeling for him. The young man thinks that he is unable to breathe, and Shayon repeats that he is disappointed that this is an adventurer for whom he has been waiting for a hundred and fifty years. While Hidaka is in the process of healing himself, the king, leaving, adds that since then they have become much weaker. Shayon turns towards the young man and asks if he is a priest. Zuri asks to give her time to look at his characteristics. The magical creature exclaims in surprise that the young man is a healer. The snake king assures that the healer could not have reached him alone. Zuri says it's weird. The king does not understand what his being is talking about and specifies what exactly. It wants to say something about the young man's skills but does not have time to finish. Hidaka takes the wand and attacks the creature with holy light. With his blow, he destroys the magical creature and it instantly evaporates. A notification comes that the blessing of the goddess is activated and it is necessary to pick up the loot. The king exclaims that as a young man he dared and wants to attack. However, Hidaka manages to get ahead of him and carry out his attack first. He unleashes a magic attack and thinks he's hit the Snake King, so he wonders if he's finished. But it turns out that Shayon managed to dodge his magic blow. The king yells, asking what kind of magic he uses, and then sees that his sword is chopped off. Hidaka is upset that only his sword was hurt. The king wounds Hidaka and is angry at the young man for killing Zuri, and now he also wants to deprive him of his sword. Hidaka falls to his knees from such a strong blow, and Shayon asks if the young man still thinks that he will be able to leave him alive today. The king looks at the wand and asks if he did the magic that killed his magical being. He believes that it is, but does not understand why there are no traces of use left on it. Shayon, with a misunderstanding, says that Hidaka is the hero. The young man replies that the flying eye has already told him that he is a healer. The snake king wounds Hidaka, not believing his words. He thinks that the young man is hiding his status. The enemy demands Hidaku to answer the truth until he has completely stripped him. Hidaka continues to answer that he is a healer. The king, continuing to inflict wounds on him, 
calls the young man a liar and claims that Hidaka could have killed him, and that's why Zuri was so wary when he saw his characteristics. The wounded Hidaka is lying on the floor without strength. He can't get up and realizes that recovery never comes. Sheon shouts that he is definitely hiding something, since the healer cannot use attacking magic. Hidaka repeats once again that he is a healer. The king is furious and demands to tell him his name. The young man does not understand why he needs his name. He remembers Siki's words that Nito would be more suitable for him, since it is better than being a healer. Hidaki manages to get back on his feet, despite multiple injuries, and he decides to answer that his name is Nito. He reflects that now his name will be Nito. He wants to spread this name and take revenge already under this pseudonym, because he believes that being killed by Nito is an incredibly great humiliation. The king mockingly clarifies whether he said Nito. The young man shouts in response that he is Nito and not Nito. Nito angrily shouts if he has hearing problems. Sheon laughingly asks what kind of hero the young man is in general. Nito shouts irritably that he has already said several times that he is a healer. The king looks at him and says, disappointed, that it's too boring. He attacks, making multiple deep cuts on the young man's body. Nido falls to the floor at death, and the Snake King stands over him, saying that the moment of his end has come. The enemy swings, ready to take Nido's life. The young man reflects that he will die just like that, without having done anything in his life. At the last moment, he manages to attack with a wave of erosion, which stops the sword and attacks the king. He, without expecting it, falls under such a powerful blow. The defeated enemy is amazed that the young man still has mana left to use magic. He says that in these 150 years, apart from Nido, no one has been able to defeat him. Nido replies that the king was good at fighting. Sheon laughs at the fact that the young man decided to evaluate his fighting abilities and sarcastically calls it generosity. The Snake King advises him to hide his true identity, but Nido does not understand why he needs it. Sheon says that even he, the Snake King, who lived for hundreds of years and was known throughout the continent in the past, lost to him so easily. Lying near death, he asks Nido again if he is a healer, but without waiting for an answer, he says that now he believes his words. The king says that the big, unknown magic of the elementary class will attract others, and everyone will want to get it for themselves. He argues that this world rejects things that it cannot understand, and weak classes should remain weak, so it is better for a young man to hide his strength from prying eyes. Nido asks the king for permission to ask the question, and Sheon asks him what exactly the young man wants to know. Nido tries to find out from him if he knows at least some information about the God of Revenge. Sheon remembers the man who mentioned it. The man in the memories, addressing him, says that he has decided something for himself. The Snake King is silent until the young man calls out to him, calling him uncle. He thinks about what it means, how it all happened. He laughs, saying that he was surprised to hear this name. Nido joyfully asks that it turns out the king knows something about him. Sheon replies that even though it was a long time ago, he still remembers that this nickname belongs to an adventurer. Nido does not know who the adventurers are, and the Snake King says that if Nido travels, he will understand everything himself. The young man is completely sure that the king knows something about this, but Sheon ignores his words, saying that in the end he had a good time. The Snake King asks for Nido's real name, because he knows that he invented a pseudonym for himself. The young man decides to give his real name, Masamune Hidaka. Sheon asks again with a smile on his face and wants to say the name of the guy who was before Nido, but does not have time. Nido turns to him and says that his character is different from the previous one, but the Snake King no longer hears him. He died of his wounds. I received a notification about the activation of the blessing of the goddess and a request to pick up the loot. Nido notices that Sheon's sword is flying up. The young man receives the equipment snake sword cudgels. Nido wonders if he is supposed to use such a weapon if he is a simple healer. The young man looks at the king and says that he should be given his due. Nido gets the evil eye of truth skill, which allows you to view the status of the goal. He comes to the conclusion that he got this ability from Zuri's flying eye. From Sheon, he gets the divine speed skill that made him so fast. The young man looks at the defeated enemy and wonders why he still does not disappear. Nido notices a ladder in front of him and decides to check it out, hoping that it will lead him out of this maze. Climbing the stairs, he comes to the decision that he will definitely get out of this place, no matter how long it takes and will not die until he takes revenge on all his abusers. Chapter 4.1 Nido learned that magic can easily get rid of a hangover, so he continued to drink sake. Climbing the stairs, his thoughts were only occupied with when it would finally end. Suddenly, someone screams, which warns Zeke that there is something behind him. 
Nido looks around, as he is sure that he heard someone's voice. Nido finds himself right in the middle of a dense forest and feels extremely confused. Looking around, he wonders how he suddenly found himself in this forest, because he is sure that he was just climbing the stairs. He experiences a strange feeling and assumes that it was teleportation, although he thinks that he did not touch anything and did not activate anything. Nido is happy that he finally got out of that creepy maze to freedom. He is in anticipation that his adventures begin in a new world for him. At this moment, he hears someone calling someone named Alford. He turns around at the voice and hears that someone is warning Zeke to be more careful. Three young men are standing in the forest, and one of the guys shouts at a girl named Elsa that she should watch more closely. The girl replies that she herself knows this without his instructions. The young man continues to criticize Elsa, claiming that she had no reactions. Nido assumes that ordinary people are standing in front of him. They are trying to figure out who Nido is and how he got here. The young man with long dark hair says it doesn't matter and suggests that Nido may have overheard their conversation. He pulls out his sword and menacingly approaches Nido, informing his friends that he is going to kill him immediately. The young man is convinced that Nido was watching them, and approaches with a sword. Nido shouts at him to stop and put away his weapon. He makes it clear that he doesn't know what conversation the guy with long hair is talking about. The young man ignores his words and goes on the attack. He swings his sword, but Nido manages to dodge the blow at the last moment. The guy with the sword wants to attack again but Nido suddenly disappears from the opponent's field of view, which causes him extreme amazement. Nido suddenly finds himself behind the young man and shouts that he will not be able to finish what he started. Nido has a sword in his hands, which he holds right at the neck of their friend, Elsa. A young man with a katana swears, saying that he caught him by surprise. Nido asks him not to move, he assures him that he just wants to ask. Nido insists that the guy does what he tells him to do. First, he asks him and his friend to immediately put their swords back in their scabbards. Elsa tells Zeke that they have already lost. She claims that Nido's movements were so fast that they were indistinguishable, and she could not even feel his approach. The young man does not let go of his sword and ponders his next actions. The guy realizes that they are now in a losing position. He lets go of the sword, declares that they surrender, and asks to let his girlfriend go. Nido has a strange, familiar feeling for him. He does not believe the young man and suspects that this is a common trick. Zeke replies that he even took his hands off the sword. But Nido still continues to doubt the veracity of his intention. The guy keeps assuring him that this is true and Nido thinks about it. As a result, Nido releases the frightened girl. The girl thanks Nido, and he says that then he will move on. When Nido is already leaving, suddenly Zeke asks him to stop for a minute. Nido turns around and maliciously asks if they still want to kill him. The guy introduces himself, but Nido rudely replies that he is not interested. Zeke replies that he has one request for Nido. The young man wants to ask Nido for help. Nido is surprised by this request, and a nervous laugh escapes from him. The young man does not have time to answer when Elsa shouts to Zeke, demanding that he not involve Nido in this. Nido thinks it's too much trouble for him anyway, so he's not going to help them. Finally, he advises them not to hit other people anymore, because it's bad and waving his hand at them, he starts to leave. Nido does not have time to go far, as suddenly Zeke uses fire magic. Several large fireballs are flying, forming in the air, and flying straight into Nido. He dodges the attack, not believing what is happening, and asks Zeke what he is doing. The guy uses a fire hammer, and a large fire attack accumulates in the air above him. The young man says that he will act in cold blood. Zeke continues to persistently ask for help during the attack. He assures that they only need a little of his help. Nido thinks that this guy is just a real madman. The young man reflects on Zeke's words and the events taking place and does not understand how one can hide in such an environment. He decides to take action. Zeke wants to talk about the reason for asking for help. He uses the magic of the evil eye and sees a panel of Zeke's characteristics in front of him. It says there that his name is Zeke Ladderbach. He is a dragon knight with good parameters and many magical, fiery skills. Nido honestly admits that he is very jealous of him. He reproaches Zeke for using such powerful magic for nothing. The young man replies that Nido says so, simply because he has never used it himself. Zeke continues his attack and shouts at Nido not to behave this way. Nido recalls that, while climbing the stairs, he tried to apply an inversion to one of the spells, namely attribute assignment, magic zeroing. He realized even then that since he did not yet know the radius of his action, and the scale of the spell that he could destroy, he must first be tested in real combat. That's why he waited so long. Nido says that since there is such a huge difference in levels between them, he thinks he should try it right now. 
Zack asks Nito what he is talking about. But Nito, deciding not to answer his words, simply uses the magic of zeroing in response to his magic attack. With the help of magic, Nito manages to stop his magic strike. Zeke doesn't understand what happened to his magic circle, or what happened at all. He begins to think that Nito is a monster. Nito prepares to attack back and angrily asks them if from the very beginning they were leading everything to use their dirty trick. Elsa grabs Nito's hand and apologizes for her friend. The girl is afraid that he will kill her friend, and says that he made a mistake trying to justify him. The girl screams that the act was wrong, and she understands it. But she begs Nito not to touch her friend, promising to do whatever he wants in exchange for his mercy. Nito suddenly remembers unpleasant moments from his past when Siki treated him with ridicule and dislike. Nervous laughter bursts out of his chest. With disappointment in his voice, Nito asks if he has become like a bad person now. He decides to repeat once again that he will not help these people and wants to continue his journey. But suddenly Zeke makes Nido an offer to become their comrade. Nido turns around and his face expresses surprise and incomprehension. Zeke says that he has long realized that he is not alone and could change a lot, so now he is looking for strong partners. Nido is stunned by this admission. According to Zeke, there are only four active members in their organization, and not everything always goes smoothly as we would like but at the moment they are in dire need of strength. Zeke claims that Nido is a great fit for their team, but the young man is interested in what benefits he will receive if he decides to join them. Zeke assures them that they can get him anything he wants, but Nido, answering, says that there is nothing he needs right now. Zeke asks if Nido will refuse, even if they can fulfill his every wish. Elsa demands Zeke to immediately stop his persistent persuasion, but he remains adamant. He admits that he doesn't have much time left, and he needs a strong companion. Zeke holds out his clenched hand and asks Nido to take something. The young man carefully takes the ring in his hands, and Zeke informs him that this is their means of communication. They pour their magic power into it and this gives them the opportunity to communicate with each other at a great distance. Zeke suggests that Nido not rush to refuse, but take some time to reflect on their proposal and give an answer only when he is completely sure of it. Zeke says that they gave their organization the name Dragon Heart, and they strive to completely rid this world of the rotten top for the sake of the common good. Nido asks with a laugh and irony in his voice that they really took him for a follower of their ideas. According to Zeke, they staged a race to the Duke's territory, where they are now and after them there was not a single soul left. Nido wonders if they killed everyone there. Based on Zeke's words, he decides that it would be better to accept the ring and take it with him. A friend of Zeke and Elsa expresses amazement. He is surprised when he sees Nido using spatial storage. Nido wonders if this spell is that rare. The young man replies that he sees him for the first time in his life. Nido is interested in the further plans of the guys. Zeke replies that they are currently on their way to the kingdom of Greyburg. Zeke mentions that a month ago this country called for heroes, and they want to start their investigation about this. Nido realizes with horror that a month has passed since he and his entire class were moved to this world. He worries that during this time he has missed a lot of important events. Zeke, realizing that Nido is worried about something, is interested in his condition. Nido was so lost in his thoughts that he did not answer the question put to him. When he came to, he lied that he was just thinking about going to the city. Elsa is happy to announce that they are now on their way to Hawson, and that there are three days left on foot and they will arrive at their destination. Zeke reminds Nido that he never told them his name. The young man decides that he cannot tell them his real name, since they are heading to Greyburg, and introduces himself by a pseudonym, Nido. But suddenly he remembers the Snake King Shaon, who called him Nido. He decides that from now on he will call himself Nido. The young man looks at the sky and rejoices in his long-awaited freedom. He takes a leisurely stroll through the woods, enjoying the moment when he doesn't have to do anything and he can just take a walk. Suddenly he hears a noise from the trees. A pack of wild wolves appears in front of him and Nito is delighted with this turn of events. He rejoices, realizing that this is it, after all, this is another world. According to Nito, the situation is starting to heat up, and he just needs to relieve his tension. First he wants to use magic to check their status, and what he sees shocks him. He sees that they are too low for him, the 8th level. He remembers that Zeke had a 48th and he believed that this was the norm for this world. He's ready to fight and says it's time for him to start collecting loot. Nito hears a shout that politely asks him to duck, and someone quickly runs past him towards the wild wolves. This man, in a matter of seconds, overcomes the entire pack of hunting wolves at once, without making any special efforts. He warns Nito that they are in a dangerous place for them. The person who so easily defeated the wolves turns out to be a cute girl with short hair. 
She wonders if Nito has received any injuries. The young man replies that he has not received any wounds, but thinks to himself that this is too much. While the girl proudly announces that Nito's life is no longer in danger, even though the situation was quite dangerous, Nito decides to take a look at her characteristics panel. He finds out that her name is Shira Eckhart. She is a senior knight and she has the 32nd level. The girl comes close to Nito and with a misunderstanding notices that he does not look particularly happy from her words. Nito is frightened by such close contact with Shira. The girl is loudly called from the cart, calling her Miss Shira, and she and Nito get into it. The man sitting there turns out to be a merchant. He, smiling amiably, says that he is William Vector and introduces his cabbie named Kays, who dryly adds that he is glad to meet you. The girl introduces herself as Shira Eckhart and looks at Nito without taking her eyes off. Under her persistent gaze, Nito calls the pseudonym he chose, which Shara called a rather strange name. Nito thinks about what's wrong with her. William informs Nito that they are taking the goods to Radhausen. He cheerfully says that he met Miss Shira quite by accident when he was looking for an escort in the capital. Nito confusedly declares that he will probably only interfere with them on their way, but the merchant insists that the more fellow travelers, the better it will be on the way. The man praises the girl with admiration, describing how she felt something was wrong and reacted so quickly by jumping out of the cart that he did not even have time to realize what was happening. He admitted that up to this point, he had never seen the White Royal Knights in action, although he had heard a lot about them. Shara modestly claims that she didn't do anything so special. Nido is interested in who the Royal White Knights are, and William is extremely surprised that the young man does not know anything about them at all. He says that the capital of Radhausen is ruled by the kings of the family that have been sitting on the throne for several generations, and the current ruling king is Arnold Radhausen. William continues his explanation by saying that the Royal White Knights are a unit that is located in the capital under the direct command of the king alone. The man adds that the Royal White Knights only occasionally appear in public places, and so people know almost nothing about them. William turns to Cher, noting that to meet a knight like her in such a place is something akin to a miracle. The girl is confused by these words, trying to deny their truthfulness. Nito also begins to think that he clearly did not expect to meet a gray-haired girl. Looking at her, he realizes that she really looks like a heroine from another world. Shara notices the fact that she also knows something about William, but the merchant jokes that he can't even compare with her leg. Shara praises William, saying that you can buy the rarest items from him that you will not find anywhere else. She claims that there is no one in the world of merchants who does not know his name and even in the neighboring kingdoms they have heard about him. Based on Shira's words, Nito comes to the conclusion that William definitely needs to have an escort on his way. The merchant only expresses his joy that his business is now significantly going uphill. William asks Nito how he ended up in such a place. The young man decides not to go into details, telling the whole truth about himself, and says that he was just thinking about a little adventure. The man assumed that Nito was heading to the guild. Nito thinks that, of course, there must be a place in this world where people's dreams originate. He replies to the merchant that this is where he is heading his way. Shira cordially offers to escort Nito to the guild as soon as they arrive in the capital. The girl asks with interest what class Nito belongs to, but the young man is not sure if he can tell them the truth about himself. Nito recalls Shayon's advice about hiding his identity, and the words Zeke told him. He is lost in doubt, trying to decide what is best for him to do now. He thinks about the fact that he can now lie and say that he is a sorcerer or a swordsman, but he abruptly becomes disgusted by such a thought. Shara turns to him again, waiting for him to answer her. Nito decides to tell them the truth. He announces that he belongs to the class of healers, which causes William to be surprised. The man assumes that Nito wants to find a team in the guild. Shari offers to let her talk to the guild. She believes that together they will definitely be able to come up with something suitable. The girl enthusiastically declares that he will definitely be able to find partners for himself, since a healer would not interfere with even the most experienced adventurers. She enthusiastically says that he can become an example for all those people who complete because of their low class. Nito notices her confidence and promises that he will do everything in his power. As they continue their journey to the capital, Shira casually asks Nito if he wants to learn fencing skills. Shara reminds him that his mana is not consumed at all when practicing fencing, since it is not a magic attack. Nito asks in surprise, what, can healers use a sword? The girl does not understand why Nito thought that since he was a healer, he could not use a sword. She replies that healers can use anything, even an axe, a sword, or even a rapier. Nito understands that the class does not have such strong restrictions as he previously thought. 
because of the words of the girl who claimed that healers can only heal and nothing more. Nito decides to clarify whether the healer can use magic attacks, such as fireballs or electric shocks. Shira says it will be too difficult for them to use these types of attacks. She begins to explain that there are some significant differences between a magician and a healer due to the fact that the very nature of their magic is initially different from each other. Nito is interested in the purpose of attribute assignment, adding that he is just learning and does not know much yet. Shara replies that attribute assignment is different from magic attribute. The young man is interested in how exactly they differ from each other. She explains that the fundamental difference is that attribute assignment is magic applied only to weapons, and it is impossible to use attributes such as fire or water without magic power. Nito understood little of this flow of information. Shira adds that it is extremely unusual for a healer to use attribute assignment, so she again strongly advises him to take up fencing. Nito believes that this skill can clearly be useful to him in this world. Shiri enthusiastically asks to be sure to let her know if Nito still decides to try himself in fencing. Nito and his companions arrived at a small village called Tanya, and William offered to stop there for a while to take a break from the long road. They got down from the cart and noticed a crowd of men gathered around someone. They decide to approach and find out what happened by contacting the locals. An elderly man sitting in the center of this crowd of people drew attention to the people who had arrived in their village and asked a question about who they were. Nito, Shira and William introduced themselves and explained that they were on their way to Radhausen and wanted to stay in their village for just a couple of days. However, the man apologized to them with regret, saying that this village is currently not in a state to receive any guests. The village elder explained that their village was recently attacked by bandits and took all the young girls from the village. A crowd of local residents began shouting that they could not sit idly by and their duty was to rescue the abducted girls. It is for this purpose that they have all gathered here. Shira suggests that these bandits are different from the usual ones, since their attack on the village was strictly planned, and they are probably connected with a dealer of prohibited goods. She concludes that they have very little time left before the girls are taken away. Based on the revealed facts, the girl concludes that the locals need external help to save the girls. Shara bravely declares that they will go to save the girls instead of them. The head of the village objects, claiming that it is impossible, because they are guests in their village. However, William replies that they are not technically guests yet, and the elder can rely on them. The merchant claims that Keys and Shira can easily deal with them, since they are both quite strong. Shira turns to the villagers, asking if they have any information about the location of the bandits' camp. There was a commotion, and suddenly someone from the crowd shouted that he knew the exact way. A little boy named Jake comes forward. He confidently declares that he followed the bandits from the very beginning of their attack and while all the adults were on the hunt, he followed the robbers and made notes on the trees. He says that after climbing the mountain, he found their camp, where he saw his mother and all the other girls sitting behind bars. The elder mentions that Jake's mother is his only relative for him. Shira says that it is necessary to act without slowing down until the girls are taken away. Jake claims that he can guide them to the robbers' camp and loudly exclaims that he wants to save them all. The four of them climb the mountain and see a camp belonging to bandits. Shira insists that the boy return alone back to the village, explaining that he cannot stay with them, as the most dangerous part is about to begin. Jake quickly agrees and quietly runs away. Nito, watching the bandits and the kidnapped girls, thinks that what is happening reminds him of a certain game event. Shira quietly whispers to Nito that she will give him a signal as soon as she and Kays clean up the neighborhood and politely asks him to wait here. Shira tells him that healers do not possess attacking magic and Nito agrees to stay, adding that she should not worry, and if anything happens, he will come to the rescue. Nito looks after the girl, secretly offended by her words that since he is a healer, it is better for him to wait here. He thinks it's not necessary with his level, but remembers that Shara doesn't even know about it. He reassures himself that he still wants to watch someone like the Royal White Knight. At this time in the village, the elder anxiously asks if the four of them will be able to cope with a whole group of bandits. William asks to trust them, saying that Kaze has also joined them, and Shara is the acting royal white knight. The girl expertly pierced through one of the bandits and went on. When Shira gave the signal, Nito came out from undercover and examined several large bandits killed by Shira. He comments on what is happening, admitting that this is exactly what he expected from Shara, because she is a royal white knight. The girl only replies that there were not so many of them. They release the girls and Shira says it's time to return to the village, assuring that they are going to escort them to the village so that they feel safe and not worry. Shira believes that they were very lucky 
because it was at this time that the rest of the bandits went somewhere. However, despite the fact that there is no one around, Nito does not leave a bad feeling, and he looks around. Shira urges Nito to go further, but the young man advises her not to lower her vigilance and be on guard. At this moment, a voice is heard asking where they are going. The bandits returned to their camp and surrounded Nito, his comrades and the rescued girls. Shara recognized these robbers and was just about to tell about them when one of the robbers interrupted her, swearing that these guys could not be trusted with anything. Nito realizes that the kidnapping of the residents was just a decoy. At this time, Shara calls this man Oliver Joe. He asks in surprise that it turns out she knows him. The girl says that he is a former royal knight of Radhausen, the commander of the capture unit known as the Ash Squad. She says that two years ago, the leader of the squad suddenly killed all his subordinates, and thereby ignited the flames of war. Oliver slightly bows and sarcastically thanks for the performance, saying that as they may notice, now he has gone into bandits. Shira doesn't understand why people keep following him. Oliver asks her again. He wonders if people still believe in the royal and knightly oaths that they give to their country, adding who else needs these rotten things at all. Shara exclaims, refuting Oliver's words, saying that the current king of Radhausen is an incredibly generous man. However, Oliver decides to remind her of the king's order called Absolute. He claims that the killers have the same eyes as Shira and asks her if she thinks a man who has sworn allegiance to his country should have such eyes. He assumes that now Shara will answer that she is not like that at all, but without giving her the opportunity to answer, he offers her to sell herself more expensive. Oliver orders the bandits to kill them all, and the bandits immediately attack without regret. Shira stands in front of Nito and asks him and the others to move away, trying to protect everyone at once. Shira, without slowing down, reacts to the bandits' attack by using the magic attack ice front and kills several attacking opponents at once with one blow. Oliver claps his hands and says that this is exactly what you would expect from a white royal knight. Shara is upset by the fact that he managed to notice her magic attack. Oliver claims that a green fighter like her will never be able to hide anything from him. At this time, while Shara is distracted, one of the bandits notices that no one is covering Nito and decides to take advantage of the moment by attacking him. Suddenly, Keys appears in front of him and with the help of an explosive barrier easily overcomes the enemy, killing him. He turns to Shur and asks her to focus her attention on the center. Nito sincerely admires the abilities of Shira and Keys, confident that the attacking bandits are simply not capable of something like that. Shira and Keys quickly and easily defeat their opponents. Oliver, watching the battle, notices that the bandits are very weak and he is disappointed by the fact that for all the years spent by thieves they have not been able to gain strength. Shira, having completed her fight with the last attacking bandit, suddenly hears someone's familiar voice that screams for help. The woman, seeing Jack in Oliver's hands, wants to run to him, but she is stopped. Jack screams, but the thug grabs him by the hair and tells him to shut up immediately. Shara asks in disbelief what Jack is doing here and Oliver replies with a grin that he is just used to doing everything alone. He adds that sending him home alone while in enemy territory was a strategically stupid decision on the part of the royal knight. Shira menacingly demands that he release the young man. Jack lets out a piercing scream, appealing to Cher to save him, and Oliver angrily repeats that he immediately shut up. Oliver threatens to pierce Jack's ear or throat if he's being so noisy. He puts a knife to his neck and sarcastically declares how he would not accidentally kill him. Shara realizes that she will not be able to save him in time. With tears in her eyes, the woman loudly shouts the young man's name. Suddenly, Nito appears behind Oliver, holding a dagger in his hand. Nito instantly pierces his neck with a knife with such speed that neither Oliver nor the others even have time to understand how it happened. Oliver dies almost instantly from the wound. Jack turns around and asks in surprise how Nito ended up near him. The young man leaves the question unanswered, seeing that everyone around him is in shock, staring at him. He, feeling nervous, declares that it is time for them to return to the village, because the villagers who are waiting for their return may start to worry about them. Kaze agrees with Nito's words, but Shira, grabbing him by the shoulder, insists that he explain everything to her first. The young man pretends that he does not understand what he is talking about and asks what exactly she wants to know from him. Shira turns him around and starts asking him how he was able to do it. She notes that he is a healer and cannot understand how he managed to stick a knife in Oliver's neck and also how he managed to move so quickly. She screams and asks if he is hiding something from her. Seeing an enraged Shira, he realizes that he is in a difficult situation right now. 
Shira remembers the status and demands that he show it to her immediately. Nito, trying to get out of it, suggests going back to the village first. Shira agrees with displeasure, but insists that he explain himself to her as soon as they return to the village. Nito and Kaze are left alone behind, and the young man praises Kaze's magic, calling it amazing. Kaze looks suspiciously at Nito and replies that his magic is definitely not as good as his. Nito thinks about the fact that Kaze looks like he wants to kill him. Nito, watching Shira and the locals, reflects that they shouldn't have seen his power. But if he hadn't used it, Jack could have been dead already. He does not want to ignore Shayon's advice, but believes that his decision was the right one. Because this act can be considered good. The whole village was looking forward to their return, and everyone was incredibly happy when they saw the girls abducted by bandits. Nito is standing on the sidelines, watching the touching moment of family reunion, when he notices a girl standing alone near the barn, whose face is covered with a hood. He asks the girl if she is going to return to her family. However, the girl does not even turn in his direction, continuing to stand silently, which confuses Nito. A woman with short hair asks if this girl is from their village. She says that even though they were locked up together, but she does not know where she was brought from, because the girl did not talk to anyone and did not answer any questions. Shira carefully notices that the girl had a very hard time, and assures her that everything is over and they will not let her offend anymore and will definitely help her. Shira tells her that she can worry because tomorrow they will go to the royal capital, where they can apply to a special institution so that she can be sent back to her hometown. Nito adds that if a girl is not satisfied with something, then she can go wherever she wants. But until they find out where she is from, then it will be impossible for them to send her to her hometown. Shira whispers to the young man to express himself in a softer way. But to the surprise of Nito and Shira, the girl suddenly grabs the edge of his clothes. The offended girl leaves, stating that then she leaves it all to Nito. The young man thinks that he overdid it a little, but the girl replies that she just didn't really like Shara for some reason. Nito is surprised that the girl is able to talk, and asks why she hasn't uttered a single word all this time. The girl quietly replies that he is different, but Nito cannot make out the words she said. She takes off her hood, revealing her face in front of Nito's eyes, and calls her name, Todorika. Nito, seeing the girl's face, blushes, feeling some embarrassment. Todorika clarifies whether he listens to her attentively. Nito answers, confirming that he heard everything. The girl asks to be called simply by the abbreviation Toa. At this time, Shari watches their conversation from the side with a dissatisfied look. The young man wants to introduce himself by the name of Nito, but suddenly wonders if it's worth doing. He decides for himself that lying is not the best solution and tells her his real name, Massimune. However, nervously asks Toa to call him Nito in front of everyone else, and she easily agrees. The young man asks why she was caught, and Toa replies that she does not know herself. She says that she was hiding in the forest, and at some point she was unexpectedly caught. Then Nito tries to find out where her house is, but the girl again replies that she does not know. He concludes that they will have to be patient, and Toa agrees with his words. While loading things into the cart, Kaze asks William's opinion about the events of the day. He answers with a question about what kind of things Nito would be able to do if he became a royal knight. Kaze thinks it would be something impressive and remembers that Nito defeated Oliver using only a simple piece of a sword and nothing more. However, the problem, in his opinion, lies in the class belonging to Nito. William wonders if Nito will become violent in the future, finding some irony in the fact that such an adventurer has a completely unsuitable class for him. He assumes that Nito's path will be thorny but Kaze immediately denies his words. Kaze is sure that Nito will never have any problems at all. He believes that the young man is a real monster. William is extremely surprised by his words and says that if Kaze himself thinks so, then the situation becomes even more interesting than it was before. William smiles while Shara glares at Toa, who is sleeping quietly on Nito's shoulder. The young man reacts in fright, considering Shara's look quite creepy. In the early morning, the five of them left the village of Tania and continued their journey to Radhausen. Suddenly Shira remembers that Nito promised to show her his status. She can't believe that a simple healer could defeat an opponent like Oliver so easily. She hopes that this time she will get a more convincing explanation from him. To begin with, she furiously clarifies whether he is really a simple healer, to which she receives a positive response. Nito shows William and Shari the modified stats panel and says he didn't even think to lie to her about his status. He points to the skill divine speed and claims that it was thanks to this skill that he was able to get to Oliver so quickly. Shira says she understood everything and apologizes for her past behavior. Nito calms her down, assuring her that everything is fine and he is not offended by her. 
he smiles and thinks to himself that he is very glad to have such a skill as mimic style, which was very useful to him at the moment. The cart pulls up to the huge walls, and William happily announces that they have finally reached Radhausen. Nito thinks that what should be expected from the capital, the city is simply huge. They are strolling through the streets of the city when William announces that their paths diverge here, as he is heading to the royal castle. He tells them to take care of themselves. Nito expresses his sincere gratitude that William took them to the capital. They say goodbye to each other, and the merchant leaves on his way. Shara offers to go to the guild, as they originally agreed. They reach a large, beautiful building, and going inside, they see a huge number of people sitting at tables and having fun. While Nito is surprised that the guild is combined with a tavern, Shira asks him to come to the counter. There, the girl politely asks him to put his hand on the ball in order to find out his status for subsequent registration. He puts his hand on the ball and decides to use his mimic style skill, hoping that it will work in this situation, because he does not want to attract a lot of unnecessary attention to himself. The girl behind the counter voices his chosen alias, letting him know that his skill is working. A corrected panel of its characteristics is displayed on the ball. The girl clarifies his belonging to the class of healers accepts the data. Nito is happy that everything worked out perfectly. Shira announces that he has successfully passed registration and is interested in what his next actions will be. Nito thinks about it and asks Toa if she wants to go to the government now. He says that there they could find out information about her hometown, but the girl puts it off, stating that she wants to do it later. Nito notices that Toa is kind of gloomy. The young man decides to ask the girl if she also wants to become an adventurer, and she, without thinking for a long time, agrees to his proposal. Suddenly someone comes up to Nito and puts his hand on his shoulder. A drunk, big man with a beard and a mug in his hands asks Nito if he wants to share girls with him and his friends, claiming that he still has two of them at once. Nito politely refuses, explaining that these girls are his friends, and at this moment he thinks in his head that the man specifically stuck to him. The man furiously asks if they should just leave, just because, allegedly, they are just his friends. He clarifies whether Nito is a simple healer and begins to mock him, claiming that he can only eat the leftovers of the group, and if anything runs back home to mom. Toa watches what is happening with contempt in his eyes and hears the man declare that they are adventurers with rank and that they will definitely be able to take care of them properly. Shira decides to intervene in the conversation and demands that the man apologize for the words he said. Suddenly, several young men in a knight's uniform enter the guild at once. It turns out that they came to the guild in search of Shira. The girl approaches Shur, gets down on one knee and exclaims joyfully that she was finally able to find her. She says she is glad of her safe return to the capital. Shira, in turn, turns to a girl named Annette and says that they haven't seen each other for a long time. Nito is stunned that he treats Shur with such deep respect. Annette turns to Nito and asks who all these people are. Shara replies that a man is not even worth paying any attention to. She then introduces them to Nito and Toa, explaining that she met them on her way to the capital and promised to escort them to the guild as soon as they arrive in the city. Nito says that Shira took good care of them, and a joyful Annette asks if this means that it's time for her to return back to the castle. The man begins to get angry and, grabbing Shira by the collar, says that she is clearly brave, since she decided to ignore his words. Annette knocks him to the floor, wringing his hand and screaming that how dare he touch Shira Sama. The man screamed that he was in pain. Having dealt with him, Annette suggests that Shira leave, while Nito reflects on how easily Annette defeated an adventurer belonging to the C rank. Standing near the guild, Shira says goodbye, and before finally parting, asks Toa if she is sure that she does not want to go to the government now. However, Toa replies that everything is fine and she does not need it now. Shira says that if anything happens, let them say that they are familiar with Eckhart, and asks Nito to take care of Toa. The young man responds by assuring her that she can rely on him. The guys are thinking about what they will do next. Nito remembers that they don't have any money at all. Suddenly, a woman approaches them on the street and admires their clothes, calling her very interesting. The woman brings them to her store and is surprised that they travel absolutely without money, saying that in the current world without money, and you can die. She looks at Nito's clothes and notices that they are quite dirty. The woman says that she will still be happy to exchange these clothes for new ones and even for a girl. She will also be able to pick up something. Nito honestly reports that their clothes are in pretty bad condition, but the woman assures them that they have no reason to worry. She explains that these clothes are made of very expensive fabric, and throwing them away would be a terrible connivance. Nito is surprised by the fact that his clothes are so expensive, because it's a regular school uniform. 
He gladly accepts the offer of the shop owner to exchange these clothes for a new one. The woman is looking for clothes and is interested in which class Nito belongs to, making assumptions that he is most likely a warrior or a hunter. The young man replies that he is just a healer. She is surprised, and Nito says it's a long story. The woman decides not to continue asking him further. She gives him a small bag, explaining that it is designed so that he can carry all sorts of potions and medicinal herbs with him. Nito asks if the healer can use herbs, and the seller is surprised that he didn't know this before. The woman explains that since healers are able to use only very weak healing magic, no one forbids them to use third-party additives to enhance the effect of the spell. The seller is interested in the Toa class, and Nito wonders that he hasn't seen her status yet either. The girl replies that she is a paladin, and this causes the woman extreme amazement. Toa shows his stats panel, and Nito asks who the paladins are. The woman says that people also call them magic swordsmen. She explains that the uniqueness of paladins is that they can freely operate with both magic and the sword and even combine these two aspects with each other. She adds that Toa is a representative of the demonic race, and Nito recalls that the king mentioned his country's endless war with demonic beings, because of which he called heroes from another world. Nito clarifies who the demons are, and the seller asks in amazement, loudly, if he knows anything. She replies that she doesn't know much about the representatives of the demonic race either, only that they have a large amount of magical reserve, and this race lives on the side of the big forest. She wonders what circumstances could bring them together, calling them a strange combination. Nito and Toa changed into their new clothes. The woman admires their appearance, claiming that their outfits really suit them. The shopkeeper also gives Toa a sword, and Nito thanks her for all these things. However, the woman assures that all these things still cost less than their past clothes. She gives the rest of the money and wants to give Nito some advice. She says that, although everything will be fine in this country, but they should not build unnecessary illusions, because demons are not welcome everywhere, and the Toa will stand out from the crowd because of its high indicators of magical power. She claims that if he is a real man, then he should not give Toa to anyone to offend. Nito looks at the Toa and reflects that even in this world there is discrimination, simply because people cannot accept what they cannot understand. He replies that he will definitely take care of it. The woman accompanies Nito and Toa and says that her name is Sharon, and they can visit her at any time. They are sitting in the city, and Nito, looking at her, talks about how he would never have thought that he would meet someone like her. He realizes that her level is much higher than that of the adventurers from the guild, because there they were at the level from the 10th to the 17th or at most the level of the 23rd. But still, he decides that he is more interested in something else. He asks if Toa wants to ask anything about his status or if she wants to watch it. The girl indifferently replies that she has already seen his status. Nito remembers this and wonders what she thinks about his status. She replies that she finds it amusing. She adds that his status is abnormal, and there is no other way to call him. Nito is upset by the fact that he is abnormal even from the point of view of a demon. Nito is interested in how someone as strong as she got caught so easily by ordinary, weak bandits, because she could easily have dealt with them herself. The girl confusedly replies that she was just scared. Her words surprise Nito. He asks where she was before she ended up in that forest. The girl replies in a calm voice that she was in her castle and this throws him into shock. The young man tries to guess who she is, assuming that she is a princess or someone very important in the demon world. He clarifies what she was doing in the castle, to which he receives a short answer that nothing special. Toa says that in the morning she trained with magic and a sword, and then, until the night with her parents, she waited for her sister's return. While waiting, she often played with the trunk or talked to pixies in the garden. Nito, judging by her words, concludes that she never left the confines of her castle since she was forbidden to go outside. He realizes that she was just too scared of the outside world and the people she met, like him, who also recently came into this world. After a while, a bright magic of light was heard in the thick of the forest. Meanwhile, Nito attacked the little green goblin in hand-to-hand -hand combat. After a while, Nito and Toa appeared on the edge of the forest, and several slain demons lay next to them. Nita said it should be enough for them to be able to pay for the hotel. The girl took the teeth out of the goblin's jaw and collected them in a bag. Nito asked Toa if, after killing a monster, his corpse really remains material and decomposes. He said that it seemed to him that after death, corpses should disappear from this world. The girl replied that this happens only in the dungeons, and outside of it, the corpses of monsters do not disappear, and remain on the ground. And besides, goblins are monsters, not mammons. Nito asked if there was a difference between mammons and goblins. Toa explained that mammons have intelligence and can speak the language of people, and monsters, in turn, 
are completely different creatures. Nito remembers the servant of the Lord of Snakes and realizes that then he was not a monster, but a mammon, because he could speak human language fluently. After a while, Nito and Toa return to the Adventurer's Guild to complete the task. The girl at the reception desk said that she confirms the task of eliminating ten goblins, and then gives Nito a reward. The young man notices how Toa, standing next to him, yawns awkwardly. He told her, turning around, that it was tiring enough so they needed to find a hotel to rest. The girl at the reception desk put a map of the city in front of Nito and Toa and said that if a couple is looking for a hotel, she can show several places. Nito thanks her for her help. Suddenly, unexpectedly, someone approaches Toa and calls her a young lady. It was some kind of overdressed man. He put his hand on his chest and made a bow and then asked if he could find out her name. Nito stood between them, apologized and said that this girl was traveling with him. The man looked maliciously at the young man. He said he had never seen him here before, and then asked if he was an adventurer. Nito said that he is an adventurer and only started doing this activity today. The man strokes his hair and is surprised by the information that the young man in front of him is a beginner, so it's not surprising that he doesn't know him. He arrogantly raises his head and asks Nito if they really started their professional activity by killing some lower goblins. Nito frowned and wondered if each of these rotten personalities really likes to eavesdrop so much. Nito scratches his head and says that's exactly right, because it's hard for adventurers to be. The man wonders why the young man should justify himself like that, because low-ranking missions will not give them much money. Nito sighs, because this man is so persistent. He says it's okay and don't let the man worry about it. The man snaps and says that he was not talking to him, with the lady next to him, and the young man should shut up. He continues, saying that if the Toa goes with him, then not only goblins, but also wolves, giant snakes and even, perhaps, grizzlies will not become a hindrance for him. He also says that he was here when Nito and Toa had an argument with a man at noon. He says that Nito is a healer and then asks if he is right. He clarifies that Nito's journey seems to have ended before it even started, so he is sure that the young man is going to stay in some cheap hotel. Then he puts his hand on Toa's shoulder and asks if the girl will go with him, because he will be able to give her much more and, he thinks, he will be able to satisfy her much more than this guy. Nito frowns and thinks that this man's words definitely have a hidden subtext, but don't worry about it. He tells Toa that they need to go but the girl does not react to his words. Suddenly she summons the magic of light and directs it directly at this vile man. After a while, he was struck senseless, all his clothes were singed, and his hair stood on end. Everyone around looked at what was happening in surprise. The young man calls the girl, and she turns sharply to him. She takes his hand and tells him to follow her. Meanwhile, the man was lying unconscious on the floor. The girl was walking very fast through the narrow streets of the city, and Nito was trying to keep up with her, asking her to stop for at least a second. Suddenly the girl stopped and asked why Nito didn't say anything to that man. Because he could answer him because he is strong. Nito asked why he did that, and then replied, It's because he knows that this man is not the one to worry about. That's why Nito ignored him and avoided an unnecessary situation. He also says that unpleasant situations should be avoided whenever possible. Toa squeezed the hem of her skirt and said, turning around, that there was no point in Nito thinking about such things. She continued shouting that really the young man was not offended by the words of that man, because he laughed at the young man. Toa awkwardness said it was unpleasant. Nito lowered his eyes and thought that he was really offended and really angry, but such straightforwardness in this matter is not good. However, Toa used her magic for him, even though they had just met, and they hardly even know each other. He apologized to the girl, and he thought that revenge is not everything. This thought flashed through his mind at that moment. Then he thanked the girl for being angry with him. Nito said that next time he would try to get angry, but healers, like, shouldn't be strong, so he would try to avoid such scenes and solve everything with words. Toa said, wiping her tears, that she understood everything. Calming down, the girl said that was why he would be angry for Massimune. Nito was trying to figure out if the girl understood anything of what they had just been talking about. It seems that in some mystical way he was able to establish connections in this world and after his revenge, Nito will have a completely new life waiting for him. It changes the way of thinking. For himself and for the Toa, he was able to feel saved for the first time. After a while, at night, Nito and Toa were sitting in one of the local establishments. On the table they had a plate of meat, hot soup and salad. Different conversations were heard from different corners. Someone said that the meat was very tasty, and someone talked about monsters. Nito and Toa also talked over food. Nito asked the girl that she had probably already tried all these dishes, but Toa replied that Nito was wrong and the girl had never eaten such a thing. 
Nito was surprised and asked what the girl ate in the castle then. Toa replied that he did not remember it, because she had eaten what was prepared for her. Her mother told her that it was food that increased the level of the girl's magical abilities. Nito thought that the more he learns about her, the more curious he becomes. He understands that he will need to visit the country as a demon, and the house of Totorix is somewhere in the steppes. The girl enjoys the food and says that this food will definitely make her stronger than the food she ate before. She will have to try to taste this delicious meat again. Nito said that he was very glad that the girl liked this food. He asks her how about another task for tomorrow, because maybe the reward will be bigger. The girl said that she was not against it and only for it. Coming out of the bathroom, Nito, who was waiting for her, said that they were very lucky that they could afford to book a room in such a popular hotel. Toa agreed with these words. Nito pushes the table away and says that he will sleep on the floor and let Toa sleep on the bed. But the girl asked why not just sleep on the opposite side. Nito was surprised by this. The girl went to lie down on the bed and told Nito to come here too, because he might catch a cold if he slept on the floor. The young man began to stutter and awkwardly said that he was very tossing and turning in his sleep. The girl fluffs her pillow and says she doesn't care because she trusts Massimune. The young man asked what she meant by saying that she trusted him. The girl is already covered with a blanket, and then looks at Nito standing in place and asks if he really won't sleep, but the young man says he will. Toa had already gone under the blanket and wished Nito good night. The young man, stuttering, did the same. It was already the middle of the night. Nito knew he couldn't sleep. Suddenly Toa turned to him and asked if he was sleeping. Nito said he wasn't sleeping and had just woken up. Toa continued talking, said that she was always alone in that castle. Her parents only came home at night, and her sister never came home. The only people she could talk to were pixies. Every day was associated with loneliness, but now loneliness is in the past, because Nito is next to her. The girl turns to Nito's back and hugs him. She wishes him a good night. The young man calms down and, wishing the same Toa, also falls asleep. The next morning, someone knocked on Nito's room. He comes out all sleepy and asks Shiro what she needed in the morning. The girl says it's noon. Nito asks how she found him. Shara replied that she had been told about it by the guild. The girl thought that she wanted to teach the young man fencing. Suddenly, Toa's voice was heard from the room and asked what happened. He turns to say that Shira has come, but he did not have time to finish as he saw the appearance of the Toa when she was in open clothes. He started waving his hands and asking why the girl was dressed like that, but she said it was hot at night. Meanwhile, Shira was very angry and gave Nito a beating. The whole hotel was up in arms. Toa asked what Masamune was doing. The young man tried to explain to Shira that it was a simple misunderstanding. The girl calls for light, but Nito tried to stop her. After a while they went down to lunch. Shira said she was very sorry, but earlier she jumped to conclusions. To solve issues by force, what is wrong with the knights of this country? So she asks for forgiveness. Nito asks Toa to stop and stop, because no matter how much he is beaten, he will not be anymore. Shira asks what Nito means. Then the girl said that earlier she had heard Toa call Nito, Masamune. The girl started in surprise. The young man said that Nito was a pseudonym, but then he asked to be called Nita in public. Shara agreed. Nito thought that Toa might accidentally tell his real name, so he would have to ask her to be more careful and take care of herself in society. Shira says that Masamune is a very unusual name. She says that's really his Jikoku name. Nito asks again what it is. The girl says that, according to rumors, this country can be found on the opposite side of the continent by van. She has heard that people in this country use similar names to the name Nito. The young man understands that he will need to visit there. Then the girl asked if the young man planned something for today, because she thought to teach him fencing today. The young man said that he wanted to take the quest from the guild because he needed money. The girl asks if she can go in the company of Nito and Toa. She says she can help, and if they take her with them, they will be allowed to take a more difficult task, and the reward, in fact, will be greater. Nito says that if the girl wants to, she can join. Shara tells them to move out faster. After some time in the Adventurer's Guild, Shara told me that there is a gradation for adventurers based on their achievements. The lowest class is Class F, and the highest is SSS. Right now, Nito and Toa can only choose tasks of E rank, but if they are accompanied by Shira, they will be able to take a request of class or even higher. Nito asked if Shira was also an adventurer. The girl replied that the knights of this country are all adventurers, and in any case, every knight of the country must register with the adventurers guild, so all the knights of this country are adventurers. Nito asks if it's okay that Shira shows up at the guild two whole days a week, because shouldn't the white knights of the king be hidden from society? Shira replies that it is, but few people know about her true identity. 
She is a knight, but at the same time also an adventurer. The group approaches the bulletin board and Shira asks what kind of task Nito and Toa want to take. All the tasks for Nito are posted on the board, as if for selection. Nito looks at the board and thinks that even though Shira says so, nothing will change the fact that he can't read anything. Even that goblin extermination task was given to them by the receptionist girl. He looks at the image of some kind of monster and asks what kind of beast it is. Shira says his name is Klein. This is a huge beast with two horns that lives in the forest. He decides to take this assignment. Shira says that after completing the quest, she wants to go to the shop opposite for a while. After the registration, Shira, Nito, and Toa enter the store. The girl working there recognizes the visitor in the person of Shira and asks if she really has a day off. Then Nito comes in. He hears Shara talking about going to the woods to get Klein, so she thought she needed to stock up on medicine from Catherine. The young man asks what the girl is talking about, to which Shira replies that medicines are medicine that protects his hearing. Because Klein's voice can paralyze the body, so such a thing is necessary. Suddenly, the shop assistant approaches the group and says that she looked closely and remembered Nito, and with him the paladin girl. Shira was very surprised, and then she screamed that whether the Toa was really a paladin. The saleswoman realized that she had screwed up. After a while, they all stood at the entrance to the forest. Shira once again says that the Toa is a paladin. Nito asks why the girl is so interested in this. Shira asks if Nito really knew that there is only one person with the same class in the kingdom. Even for the royal white knights, this class is extremely rare, and the only fact that the Toa barks with such a class was very surprising to her. Nito asks if it's okay that Shira is laying out all this information to him so calmly. Nito realizes that revealing his real name to this girl was a mistake. After a while, they found themselves in the depths of the forest. They saw groups of people who were badly maimed. Shira asks if they are okay. After looking at them, she asks what happened to these people. One man says they went into the forest to look for orcs. At first everything was fine, it was the same forest, but suddenly goblins, orcs and wolves ran away from here as if something scared them. He said that then they had to return it, because it was Klein. His group saw him, but he was weird. Nito asked what he meant by being weird. The man said that his whole body was shining. Another man says he knows what ordinary clients look like, but this one was definitely abnormal. Shara asks in detail about Klein and says that he was really covered with grains of light. The man said it was very similar to this. Shara's face changed a little. Suddenly, a terrifying scream rang out throughout the forest. The wounded adventurers said that this monster had followed them. Suddenly a terrible monster appeared from behind the trees. Shira shouted to the wounded adventurers that she would detain him, so they should leave here immediately. Sauda smiles and asks if it's really Klein, but Shira opens a bottle of liquid with trembling hands and says it's not Klein. She says that she has already told the young man about graduation. There are gradations for monsters too. Killing Klein is a rank a task because Klein is a rank B monster. However, due to the special ability of the voice of some individuals and their ferocious disposition, they are called nut clients and are ranked as a rank monsters. This monster in front of them is the one whose task will say dangerous order. Shira asks Nito and Toa how they feel. Nito says he's fine and Toa says the same thing. Shara is surprised by this. She looks at her trembling hands and says that she was struck by his voice and her mana circulation in her body was completely disrupted. She recalls a case when Nito dealt with a bandit and said that if something went wrong, she could leave it all to him because then she saw him only for a moment but was very amazed. Nito looks at the monster, whose name was Nut Klein. He was level 32. The young man realized that this is a very simple and easy monster. The young man tells Shira that he understood everything, and then asked to provide everything to him. He tells Toa that he counts on her support. The girl says she understood. Shira takes her sword with shaking hands and goes to attack. She uses the ice flash and the great ice sword. She is interested in whether Nut Klein is susceptible to weapons. She decides to check it out now. Suddenly, the attack does not pass, and not a trace remains on the monster. Shara flies away from the blow. The monster attacks the girl with its paw in response, but Shara deftly dodges the blow. The monster is heading straight for the girl, but the Toa has prepared a trap in the form of a magic seal at this moment. The monster gets up on the seal, and the girl uses the magic of light. As it turned out, the monster is immune to magic. Shara says she has heard that the nut clients control magic particles with their horns. Toa says that she feels magical particles in the area. Shira says that first of all it is necessary to destroy his horns, but Nito suddenly notices some kind of glow, and shouts to everyone to move back. Nut Klein attacks with his spell and erases a huge area of land. 
Shara, who barely managed to dodge, is amazed by the magic of light, looking at the dent left by the beam of light on the ground. But Klein begins to shake and seems to be preparing to attack again. The Toa shouts that she won't let him attack, and puts her hands forward. Then she uses a very powerful spell. Shara recognizes double magic in this spell. Then the Toa pronounces the name and shouts Howl Light. Following her words, a huge ray of light shoots out of the created seals. The monster completely blocks the Toa's attack. The girl says it's impossible. Shira shivers and says that they haven't even hurt him in all this time. Nito understands that simple brute force will not solve everything. If Nut Klein controls magic particles, then his attacks will also have a magic bias. There must be a trick in his invulnerability, for example, something like his soul destroyer. Nito says that at the moment the beam was fired, part of the light around the Nut Klein disappeared, and when he opens it again, Shira asks what will happen if they accidentally get into Nito. Nito says that means, in that case, he will go alone. Shara asks to use her as a deception. The young man says that everything is fine and we need to finish this as soon as possible. In the blink of an eye, he is right over the monster's head and uses his soul-breaking magic. Then he grabs hold of Nut Klein's horns and pulls them out. The monster screams in pain. He appears right behind the girls. Shira wonders if Nito really caused the monster such pain now. The young man says that he broke his horns and now the monster will not be able to block the girl's attacks. Then he says he wants to try something, so can the girls provide everything to him. Shira says she doesn't mind. The young man thanks her. Then he acquires a strange shadow and aura on half of his body, and then tells Shira to keep everything she saw today a secret. After a while, in one of the castles, the speaker said that Klein was discovered surrounded by light particles in the grill forest. The man who was taking notes clarified about the particles of light and asked who the informant was. The speaker replied that it was four adventurers. They were injured and are currently in the hospital. According to them, three more adventurers are fighting the monster right now. A man and two girls. One of the girls was silver-haired and used a rapier as a weapon. The man is the leader of the White Royal Knights, Reinhard Rickman. The man took the raincoat and told the speaker to tell Reed and Hilda that Shara is now fighting with Nut Klein. Two days ago, when the whole village went to bed, the young man looked at Oliver's status. He was a fire mage, and even if Nito could receive elemental magic, he would not be able to use it. Suddenly Nito received some kind of message. He understands that this is somehow very much like a quest. He opens the letter. The message was about his wife Anna. It was because of her that he became a knight, while he was able to curry favor and get a leadership role. But when he returned from the battle, it turned out that his wife had become a thief and was killed during the theft. Despair overtook him and people began to mock him. Nito realized that this message had something to do with the murder of the king. He puts the sheet back in the envelope and puts it in the vault. Nito wondered why this man needed this order. There is still a lot that he could not learn from this message. Suddenly a notification pops up that Hellfire has been purchased. Nito was surprised that magic is easy to learn. But he does not know such a spell, but it is possible that this magic does not belong to the elemental. He leans against the wall of the building and sighs, saying that he hates healers. Then he thinks about whether it is possible to invert this spell. The opposite of fire is water. Nita wants to try to accomplish his idea. A notification pops up that the inversion ability from the God of Vengeance magic has been activated. The Hellfire magic is changed to a magic called Bloody Tears of the Goddess. Meanwhile, Nut Klein was writhing in pain. Nito felt a strange sensation. It's like he's changed. Suddenly something cracked in the sky. Toa told everyone to look up. Suddenly, someone's hands appeared through the crack, and then the huge head of a girl with black heads appeared. Suddenly, the monster was showered with black rain from the tears of this girl. Shara was very surprised and scared. Meanwhile, the monster was just cracking and bursting from this black liquid. Finally, there was almost nothing left of the monster. The girl began to disappear, and her last drop of tears turned into a huge amount of black liquid that destroyed the monster to the end. Toa asked Nito if this was the end. The young man replied that he thought it was. The black aura began to fade from his body, and he realized that something strange had disappeared. Suddenly, the sound of horses' hooves was heard from afar. The young man said that someone was approaching and they needed to leave before they were noticed and caught. He tells Shara that the rest stays on her because he doesn't want to be seen. The girl asks about what just happened. Nito tells her to tell her anything. He said he showed it for one reason, because he trusts her, so what she does with it now depends on her. Nito offers the girl to meet later in the capital. He will tell the innkeeper about the place, later she can ask and come to Nito. Then Nito and Toa disappear. Shira looks after them in fright, and then falls to the ground and thinks who Masamune is. 
Reinhardt Rickman says that according to the information received, Shira and her comrades should be somewhere nearby. Royal White Knight Reed Black says he hasn't fought properly in a very long time, so he hopes to cut Klein's chickpeas with his scythe. Royal White Knight Hilda Carlet slowly listened to Reed's snide words that her sister was dying now. Suddenly Reinhardt felt as if something was running next to him. He turns around abruptly. Reed asks what happened to him. Reinhardt saw that there was no one behind and said that nothing had happened. After a while, Reed stood next to a huge black pile and asked what kind of hell it was. He also asked if there shouldn't be Nut Klein in this pile. Reinhardt examined the black pile, where the skeleton was slightly visible, and assumed that this was Nut Klein. Reed started shouting that Reinhardt really believed that. The man says they don't have any other leads anyway. Then he saw Shira and asked her what had happened here and if she could have done it. The girl was sitting senseless on the ground. Hilda had already approached her and asked how she was feeling. Reinhardt says that according to the information they received, there should be two more people here, a girl and a man. Shira says they are not here. Reinhardt asks her what it all means. He says it takes at least four white knights to defeat Nook Klein and he doesn't believe Shara was able to kill him alone. Reed starts laughing and says that they seem to have been eaten by Chickpeas Klein and judging by Shira's condition, this option is correct. Hilda started yelling at Reed to shut up immediately, but the man kept laughing. Reinhardt sighs and says that he needs to contact the Knight's squad and orders everyone else to pack up. After a while, Reinhard reported back, saying that in that situation he thought that Shara had defeated Nut Klein, but because of her unstable condition, they could not confirm this. He also says that he thinks he needs to wait for the final results. The King of Radhausen, Arnold Radhausen, says that he has understood everything and that he entrusts this matter to Reinhard. Reinhard comes out of the King's office. At the exit, he is met by the Royal White Knight Daniel King. The man asks if Reinhard has talked to the old geezer. The young man calls Daniel an oddball. He laughs and asks if that Nut Klein joke was really true. Reinhard replies that an investigation is still underway. Daniel asks if there was something, but Reinhard again replies that an investigation is underway. Daniel spreads his hands and asks if Reinhard really can't tell him anything, but the young man replies that he himself is in the dark. Shara was there and if Daniel is so interested, he can ask her, and Klein's nut is opened in turn, so the man will find out everything later himself. Daniel smiles and Reinhard doesn't understand why. Then the man says that he has known Reinhard for a long time, so he asks if there was anything suspicious there. Reinhard says that according to the information received, three people fought with Nut Klein, and they only found Shira because when they arrived, there were no others. Reinhard says that Nut Klein, or rather his corpse, was so damaged that Daniel will never understand who really defeated him, not to mention a huge amount of black blood. Daniel understands that the answer to everything can be given by those twins. Reinhard says that probably Shara knows exactly what happened, but for some unknown reason she doesn't say anything about it. Daniel says Reinhard could interrogate her. The man replies that he does not want to untangle what she herself does not want to talk about. Daniel suggests that if those two were able to defeat Nut Klein, then they are definitely abnormal and maybe even as strong as they are. Reinhard adds that perhaps even stronger. Daniel starts laughing out loud saying it's just impossible. He asks if Reinhard really wants to say that those two are even stronger than himself. The man replies that he does not know this. However, if they pose a threat to the country, then the Shara protecting them must be prepared for the consequences. He also says he wants to know if they are enemies or allies. Meanwhile, Toa talks about the malicious backlash and says that healers should not have elemental magic. Nito says that from now on it will be better if this magic is sealed. After all, even with his bare hands, he easily broke the horns of Nut Klein. Toa takes Nito's hands and says that everything is fine because if he does not want to use his powers, then she will use all her capabilities and protect him. Nito thanks the girl, and then says that he has always been worried about one question. When they first met, why did the girl trust him? Toa was about to start talking, but they are distracted by Shira. The young man tells Toa that she will tell everything next time. The girl agrees. Shira asks if she has disturbed Toa and Nito, but Nito says not to worry. He also apologizes for the fact that Shira had to come all this way. The girl says that today Nito should not attract too much attention to himself. Nito wonders why this is. The girl says that the White Knights took Klein's nut. She hasn't said a word about Nito and Toa, so they have nothing to worry about, but she can't give any guarantees. Nito thanks the girl for her help. Nito asks if they can get a reward, because initially the task was to subdue the usual monster Klein. Shira says that it is better not to do this, because otherwise there will be a high risk that they will be discovered, so it will be better this way. 
Shira started asking Nito something. But before she could finish, someone appeared next to her. The girl asked why he was here, but the man said that the force that turned Klein's nut into a farm. He says it's very cool to have such power in your hands. That man was Reed Black. The man asked which of the two took his loot. When the wounded adventurers told the gatekeepers about everything, they, the Royal White Knights, immediately moved to the battlefield. However, by the time they reached their destination, Nut Klein's horns had already been broken, and only meat porridge remained of the monster and everything was covered in dark blood. Normally, killing a Nut Klein who is immune to magic is only possible with ordinary physical attacks. However, there is no doubt that all this mess is the work of magic. Usually no one can just take and break the horns of Nut Klein because of their incredible hardness. However, this does not make sense, because no matter how you look at it, even the method of killing is very cruel. Because there is only one mess left on the battlefield. Being able to kill a sacred animal as if it were an ordinary monster is not something a raid can overlook. Nito says that, in short, the knights doubted Shira from the very beginning, so they decided to follow her. Reed says Nito hit the bull's eye. Shira started shouting that Nito and Toa are her friends and they are absolutely not enemies. Reed said it was no longer up to Shira to decide. Then he jumped into the air and said that it would be up to him to decide. Suddenly Reinhard, who was sitting in his office at the time, looked out the window. He felt the magic of the raid. He assumed that something had happened. At this time, the Toa appeared in front of Nito. Reed was surprised that the girl deflected his blow at the last moment. He asked her name. The girl said that her name was Todorica and that she had killed Nut Klein. Reed started laughing, repeating the words that she had killed. He says that to think that a woman could arrange that mess. He looks at Nito and says that he still does not feel any magic from this young man. However, he feels incredible magic that comes from him Toa. He attacks the girl with renewed vigor. The girl says she's fine, so Masamune has to stand behind her. Suddenly, Reed gets very close to her and asks if the Toa really has time to turn around. The girl reflects his attack and says. Reed says it's interesting and very similar to someone who is capable of killing Nut Klein. However, all this is useless because he uses his trump card first. The raid uses fire armor. He rushes to the Toa and says it's time to start the second round. He asks the Toa not to think that now the attack will be exactly the same as before. Suddenly he touches the girl's face. Nito calls her, but Toa says she's fine. Reed asks what is wrong with her, and then says that with a simple sword, the girl will not be able to stop his scythe. So he asks the girl to use magic and show all her true power. The girl says that this is all her strength. Reed shouts and shouts that if so, then he will finish her right now. Suddenly Reinhardt appears right between them. He stops both the Toa attack and the raid attack at the same time. Reed screams and asks why Reinhard stopped him. Reinhard says that this case belongs to him now, and then threateningly asks Reed about what he thinks he is doing now. Nito uses the aura of healing and heals the wounded Toa. He smiles and says that he is lucky, because there is not even a scar left on his face. The girl thanks him. Then he asks why the girl did not use magic, because he is sure that she would not have lost to him. The girl says that she couldn't do it, because if she used it, then everything around would be destroyed. Reed says that Toa is the one who killed Nut Klein. Reinhard asks what and so what. Reed starts screaming and asking what's wrong with Reinhard. Reinhard says that the fact that the Toa killed Nut Klein does not mean that she is their enemy. She just got rid of the monster, as indicated in the task. Reed asks why. Then, she ran away from the place, because doesn't that mean that she has something to hide? He also calls Reinhard very stupid. Reed asks Nito if he really used healing magic right now. He also asks if the young man is a reaper. Nito replies that he is a healer. Reed starts laughing and says it's no wonder he couldn't feel anything from Nito. In the end, the young man is just another garbage healer. Reed continues to laugh. He turns to Toa and says that there is useless garbage in her group. Nito remembers Siki and thinks that Reed looks like him. Reinhard decides to take a look at Nito and thinks about Reed's words that he said he couldn't feel anything from this young man. He looks at Nito and something scares him very much. He thinks he can't believe his eyes, because it's impossible at all. He turns to Nito, but is interrupted by Reed. The man says that if Reinhard is not going to do this, then let him be kind enough to just stand aside. Reed says he doesn't care if someone is an opponent or something else, then when you see someone strong, it's better to get rid of him before he gets even stronger. He swings at Nito with the Toa, when suddenly Reinhard shouts at him to stop, but suddenly there is a huge explosion. Reinhard sees Nito unharmed, and at his feet lay the defeated raid unconscious. Reinhard says that now everything is clear and Nito is the one who killed Nut Klein. They were standing in a huge pit that Nito had made. From afar, Sheena could be heard shouting that Reinhard should not touch Masamune. Reinhard was very surprised that Toa and Sheena were so far away. 
it turns out that Nito simultaneously moved the girls to a safe distance and attacked the raid. Shira asked Reinhardt to lower his sword because Masamune was only doing it to protect the Toa. Reinhardt realized that he had pulled out his sword without thinking at the moment of the explosion. He apologizes to Nito and says he was a little startled. Nito asks if Reinhardt really understood from the very beginning that he was the one who killed Nut Klein. The man replied that Reed said she didn't feel anything from the young man. However, this is not possible. From the very birth, magic awakens in a person. No matter how little it is, knights can sense it from anyone. However, Reinhard goes down to the young man and Reed and says that there are exceptions when a person's magical power far exceeds their own power. In other words, Nito has a colossal amount of magic that even Reinhard and Reed can't see. Anyway, Reinhard apologizes for not being able to prevent the raid, so he says he will take full responsibility for his actions. Nito says that everything is fine and they will just forget about it. Then he says they just don't want to stand out. He and Toa just want to take the usual tasks in the guild and get rewarded as the most ordinary adventurers. They just want to live a quiet life. Reinhard says that he will make sure that Nito and Toa are given a reward for killing Nut Klein, and also he will not tell anyone about this case with the raid. However, he still has to report to the king. Therefore, Reinhard suggests playing it like Nito and Toa helped Shira in killing Nut Klein. He suggests that Nito move in this direction. The young man understands that Reinhard can be trusted and says that such an arrangement would be great. Reinhard then takes Reed, who is unconscious, and says it's time for them to leave. He asks for Massimune's name and apologizes for the inconvenience. Then he invites him to meet again sometime. After a while, Nito realizes that he did it after all. Even if the Toa held back throughout the fight, he ruined everything. Who would have thought that a simple blow from him could make so much noise? He hopes they won't be forced to fix the tiles. After a while, Daniel met Reinhardt and said that there had been so many reports about this old geezer today. Reinhardt asks him if he understood anything. Daniel says that this nut Klein was quite strange, because he barely looked like himself when they found him, so it took them a while to return the monster to its original form. The really strange thing is that it was completely empty inside. Reinhard asks what Daniel means. Daniel says that when the autopsy team realized that he was thinner than a normal nut Klein, they found that there were no organs inside him. The whole thing leads to the conclusion that he was dead from the very beginning. Reinhard and Daniel conclude that there is someone standing behind the stage and pulling the strings like a puppeteer. Daniel also says that, however, sacred animals are mutated monsters, so he has never heard of someone who is able to manipulate them. The man does not know what the enemies want to achieve, but he does not think that they will stop there, so they should explore this forest as soon as possible. Reinhardt agrees with this. Reinhardt says that he appoints Daniel as the head of the research team, and then asks if he will cope with the task. Daniel says he can handle it. Meanwhile, Reinhardt feels a very strange premonition, as if an unknown threat is coming to this kingdom. Nito and Toa didn't have any money, so they decided to accept Shira's invitation. Therefore, they ended up in the ancestral estate of the Eckhart family. After a while, sitting at the table, Nito says that he realized that Shira is a noble girl. Shira, embarrassed, says that he is a real knight, and she is not a noble lady. The man sitting next to him turned to the young man and said that he did not think that they would meet quickly. This man was Shira's father, Brown Eckhart. The man said that Shara had only talked about him last night, so after that he had a desire to meet him at least once in his life. Shira's mom Maria Ikarug asked if Masamune was really very strong. She says she heard that a young man saved a boy from the village of Tanya. Nito turns around, and Shira suddenly turns away. The young man wonders if Shara knows how to keep her mouth shut at all. Suddenly the door opens and Hilda, Shira's sister, comes into the dining room. The girl notifies that she is at home. The girl's mother says that Nito and Toa are their guests, whom Shira brought as her friends. Hilda introduces herself, calling herself Shira's older sister and says that she is very glad to meet you. Nito immediately blushes, but then notices the Toa's gaze on him. Hilda thanks Nito for helping Shira in the village of Tanya. She also says that today, it seems, the young man helped her out again. Nito is trying to figure out if the girl really means Nut Klein and how she knows this. Suddenly the young man remembers this girl. Because it was she who was with Reinhard when Nito and Toa were hiding from the scene of the murder of Nut Klein. Shara interrupts their conversation and says that her sister Hilda is also a royal white knight, just like herself. 
Nita will wonder if there is a possibility that all the royal white knights come from noble families, like the Eckhart family. Nito says that both sisters serve the country and are part of the Royal White Knights. He didn't expect anything less. Hilda says that it so happened that the White King had a couple of empty seats. Nito says that he understood, and then asks if Shira and Hilda can be considered heroes. Hilda says that she, like Shara, studied fencing from a young age and became a Knight of the Kingdom. Only years later they were recognized and appointed White Royal Knights. However, the story of the Commander of the White Knights is different from the story of Hilda and Shira. He was personally chosen by the White King at the age of only 12. Someone like Reinhard can be called talented, because he is a real genius. Then the girl smiles and says that Massimune is also in a completely different league. The young man blushed and thought about how much this girl knows. Shira jumps up and stops her sister screaming for her to stop looking at him like that, and then warns Nito to be careful. Shira says Hilda won't let any man she's interested in escape because she's like a snake. Hilda says that Sharad is joking, because she is the perfect older sister. She asks if he's her boyfriend by any chance. Shara says that her boyfriend or not, it has absolutely nothing to do with it. Hilda smiles and says that they will ask him directly, and then asks the young man what he thinks about Shira. The girl begins to feel embarrassed. The girl says that Shira and Nito are not dating. Shara shouts that she's asking why they're all talking about it at all. Nito thinks that, in truth, they are just on good terms but nothing more. Suddenly, Toa slammed a bottle of wine on the table. Nito is surprised that Toa drank it all. The girl turns to Shira and says that she wants to tell her something. She says that Musimune belongs to her. Nito shouts for Toa to stop because it is very dangerous and advises her to sit down. He asks her how much she has drunk. Hilda laughs and says that it looks like Shara has a rival. The girl screams that it's all out of place right now. Toa loses consciousness. Hilda smiles after them. After a while, Nito puts Toa to bed. Shira says that her sister is a very kind person, and then she apologizes for saying too much. The girl also says that when they first met, for some reason Toa opened her heart only to Nito. The young man says that he has not asked about it yet, but he will find out why, because he is also interested. He says he will ask Toa about it again. Shira says that when Nito finds out, then let him tell her too. The young man agrees. Then Shira shows Nito his room. He thanks the girl. Then Shira asks if the young man is busy tomorrow, because tomorrow she can teach him how to wield a sword. Nito thought that since he didn't have any money, he could take a job at the Adventurer's Guild, but he hopes that he can rely on Shira a little more. Then he agrees to spend time under her supervision tomorrow. The girl was delighted and says that he will meet tomorrow. Nito realized that Shira can also make interesting facial expressions. Suddenly Hilda sneaks up to him and says that it was really unexpected. Nito jumps back and asks what the girl is doing here. Hilda says she was just passing by. Then she asks if the young man was really able to defeat Reed. Nito says it looks like that was the result last time. Hilda asks if it's really for the Toa. She says that she has heard a lot, but until now she did not know what kind of relationship Nito and Toa were in. But looking at her, it is easy to understand that the Toa is not indifferent to Nito, exactly the same as Nito is to the Toa. The young man begins to feel embarrassed and says that he does not think that everything is so obvious. Hilda asks how about taking Shira with you. The girl says that this is the first time when Shira shows at least some interest in a man and she brought a familiar person to the house for the first time. Hilda, with a sad expression on her face, says that Shara is as serious as ever and now everything is not as usual. Previously, she rarely let anyone near her and always stayed somewhere halfway along the way. So when Nito is about to leave the kingdom, why doesn't he take Shira with him? Ever since she was a child, she knew nothing but the way of the sword and when Hilda realized this, Shara had already become a royal knight. However, it's so sad, because there are so many things in the world besides a simple sword. Nito says he doesn't mind, but what does Shira think about it? Hilda says the young man shouldn't be asking her now. He can ask her just before he leaves. In case of refusal, she asks to take her by force. Hilda says with a sad look that someday she will understand that it was better for her. Then they wish each other good night and disperse. The next morning Massimune opens his eyes and feels that something is moving nearby. He looks and sees their Toa, who wishes the young man good morning. The young man says good morning to the girl, and then asks her why she is in his room. The girl replies that she woke up, then there was no one around. The girl looks at the young man and asks if he really is against this. Massimune replies that he doesn't mind. Suddenly Shira bursts into the room to the young man and says that she heard him say something. 
Masamune wishes good morning to Shira with a scared face. The half-naked Toa wishes the girl the same. Shira says that Masamune is still a man, so there's nothing to be done, but she asks him to at least restrain himself a little here. Meanwhile, Hilda was standing outside the door, giggling. She showed the room to the lost Toa. After a while, Masamune learned fencing from Shira. The girl says it's too early, but why don't they take a break? The young man says it sounds great. Masamune thinks that the art of swordsmanship is quite difficult. He thought it was something he could handle quickly, but now he wonders if he can teach swordsmanship at all. He asks Shira when she started practicing with a sword. The girl starts counting and says that from about three years old. At that time, she was still using a wooden sword, but when her talent was noticed, everything changed. Then he turns to Toa and asks when she started practicing with a sword. The girl says she doesn't remember it, but it was about the same age as Shara. The girl says that one day she got lost in the woods near the castle and was attacked by Leo the wolf. Then her father saved the little Toa. After that, her sword and magic training began. Shara was very surprised and asked again if the girl was really talking about the same Leo wolf. Shara says she's never seen him. Leo the wolf is an s rank monster. She asked if Toa's father was really able to defeat him. The girl says that everything is right, and then her father made a stuffed Leo wolf out of it. Masamune asks if S-Rank is really stronger than Nut Klein. Shira, in fright, says that to say that he is stronger is to say nothing. The girl says that only if the royal knights and adventurers join forces, they will be able to defeat one such Leo wolf. The young man thinks that it would not be good to meet such a monster. Masamune then asks if anyone has seen Monster S in this country, and if anyone has fought with her. Shira says she doesn't know the details, but she has heard that in the past the royal white knights have already assembled a similar raid. She says Reinhardt should probably know about it. Shara says Reinhardt is the number one in the guild, and there are special S-rank missions for S-rank monsters. Since the surroundings of Radhausen are relatively peaceful, such missions are a real rarity. In addition, although such tasks are intended for S-rank, a rank was also often sent into battle. Also, each type of monster has its own individual differences. Even monsters of the same kind, depending on their level, can have a rank of S or higher. Masamune says that means it all depends on the level of monsters. He remembers the mimic and wonders what about him at the 500th level and what his rank will be. Shara thinks about it and says that if a monster with such a level really exists, then it is outside the rank system. Masamune asks what it means. Shara explains that basically the guild ranking system goes up to SSS. There is an infinite rank above that, but it's not really a rank, it says more that monsters are not confirmed. Masamune clarifies that in other words, level 500 is not confirmed, so it is an infinite rank. The girl says that if level 500 is found, he will still remain outside the rank system. This is a kind of insurance for the guild. Masamune asks if Shira really thinks there is no such level. The girl agrees, but says she can't completely deny it. Even if she meets one of them, she won't even be able to report him, because she simply won't be able to survive such a meeting, so it will remain unconfirmed. Masamune thinks that he would like to meet this mimic again. He thinks what kind of dungeon it was. He realizes that he had to ask Shayon about everything, because it seems to him that Shayon knew about a lot. This information would be very useful to Masamune. After this conversation, Masamune, Toa and Shira trained until the evening. When Toa got completely bored, he decided to take part two, and Masamune finally learned to wield a sword from the two of them. Suddenly Masamune finds himself in some unknown place, namely at the destroyed temple. The young man says that he was supposed to sleep in Shira's house. The young man thought that he was dead, but suddenly someone shouts at him from behind saying that they haven't seen each other for a long time. The young man turns around and sees Shayon behind him. He asks why the man was here. Shayon calms Masamune down and asks him to walk with him for a while. They are going up to an unknown place. Suddenly the young man sees an unknown person in front of him. He says that the young man has finally come here. He turns around and says that, more precisely, he was the one who called him into this world. Masamune asks who this person is and if he is a friend of Shayon. The man says that Masamune probably just won't recognize him in this guise. He then reincarnates and asks if Masamune recognizes him now. The young man recognizes this voice. The young man recalls a case when he was asked to drink a bottle with a strange liquid in the dungeon when he just started his journey. Shayon asked permission to introduce his comrade. But he did not have time to say the name because the man said that he did not need to say anything other than that. Shayon says the man is right and apologizes for it. Masamune asks again if the man really won't introduce himself, and he doesn't even know where he is right now. He asks me to at least say something to him. 
The young man thinks it's just his intuition, but he thinks that this guy is the god of revenge. He remembers Shayon's reaction at the moment when he asked him about the god of revenge and realized that he was surprised because Masamune mentioned the name of his comrade. The god of revenge says that this place means nothing to Masamune, but for Shayon and the god of revenge, this place is a kind of prison. The god of revenge says that he can be sure that his real body is now on the back of the bed, and the fact that he summoned the young man to this place is something like his soul. He asks Masamune to think about it that way. Masamune asks what the god of revenge means. The man replies that the elixir that the young man drank, he also has an effect that can connect the god of revenge with the one who drinks it. He used this connection to summon the youth here. Masamune asks to wait a minute and asks first of all what kind of elixir it was. The god of revenge replies that this elixir was created based on his blood. It gives whoever drinks it one unique ability. Although, the ability it gives will be random, but it will always give an infinite level ability. In short, an unidentified skill. However, among these abilities, there are some that the young man cannot use. The god of revenge says that Masamune was very lucky, as he was able to get an ability strong enough to defeat even Shayon. Meanwhile, Shayon was nodding his head. Masamune says that of course, the abilities he received helped him a lot back then, so he is grateful for it. But the young man asks why the god of revenge chose him. The man replies that he did not choose him and it could have been anyone. He placed the elixir there on a whim for experimental purposes and it so happened that Masamune found it. Then the god of vengeance asks if it is now possible to move on to the main topic. Masamune says that it is possible, and then adds that he also wants to return to his bed as soon as possible. Shayon comes up to him and says that Masamune will get his swordsmanship. Masamune didn't understand anything. Then the young man asks to give him a break, because he has already trained in fencing during the day, so why else would he train with two old men in such a place? Then he asks if that's the reason they called him here. The god of vengeance replies that he cannot tell him that. He also can't tell the young man why he can't say it and what Shayon is going to do is pass Masamune his swordsmanship. Everything will be over in an instant. Masamune says that the god of revenge can't tell him anything and whether this is due to the fact that he can't tell the young man his name. The god of revenge replies that he also cannot tell him his name. Masamune then turns to Shayon and asks why he is here and shouldn't he have died and what happened in the first place. The man replies that he can't say that either. Masamune reflects that the god of revenge and Shayon keep saying that they can't say anything, and they also mention that this place is a prison for them. The young man assumes that the two are somehow connected. Masamune says he understood everything and won't ask. Shayon apologizes to him. The god of revenge says that sooner or later the young man will get an answer, so there is no need to hurry. Then Shayon says that it's time to pass on his fencing skills to Masamuna. As his friend had said, it would all be over in an instant. However, he warns that the young man will feel the same pain as when he drank the elixir. Shayon asks if this will suit the young man. He says everything should be normal because he's gotten stronger since then, so it won't hurt as much as when he drank the elixir. Shayon grabs Masamune's head with his huge hand. Masamune realized that something was wrong and asked what Shayon was doing to him. The man smiled and said that means the young man agrees. Before Masamune could answer anything, a lot of different swordsmen's movements began to appear in his head. Unable to stand it, he fell to his knees, and then realized that the pain was gone. Shayon asked the young man how he was feeling. He replied that he had some memories. Shayon explained that there is a snake technique, the King of Beasts technique, Greyberg style Kenjutsu, Imperial style, Rinto, Basilisk technique and many many other techniques. Suddenly the young man notices that there is one technique, the name of which he does not know. Shayon says that this is his swordsmanship. Using all these styles of swordsmanship and his experience, he has created a skill that has no weaknesses. He says that Masamune will definitely need it in the future, but for now he should just take it all and say nothing. Then the god of revenge tells Masamune that he should send to Bayam and find a woman there, whose name is Kalifa. When he finds her, he has to tell her exactly one phrase about that, then he will be waiting for her on that hill. Masamune doesn't even know what's going on, but the god of revenge keeps adding to his to-do list. He says if she keeps asking questions, she'll understand if Masamune says it's in the third drawer. The young man agreed. He says that he just wants an ordinary adventure, but since he owes the god of revenge, he will do what he asks when he visits that city. The god of revenge also says it's just a suggestion, but he has to go to school to learn magic. The young man clarifies whether the man is really talking about magic. Masamune is a healer. But the god of revenge says that this will not be a hindrance, because when he studies, his knowledge will grow and he will be able to learn a lot about his profession. 
Even if Massimune can only use healing and support magic, he can still expand his magical repertoire, because magic is limitless. These words were reflected in Massimune's head, because these words were something like salvation. He agrees to do it. Shayon approaches the young man and says that as for his snake sword, he can give it to that demoness, because this sword is quite special, and it definitely won't suit him. Then he asks how the young man knows about the Toa. He even suggested that they were always watching him. Suddenly Massimune fell to the ground, and his strength began to disappear. His vision becomes blurry. The god of vengeance said it looked like time was up and they couldn't summon him here so many times. There is a possibility that this may be their last conversation, so he asks them to find them. At this time, in the royal capital of Rajasin, in the old town area, an unknown person was walking through the streets. A man was sitting at the table and said, Did Madame Fran Borfren come to him? He also apologizes for making her come all this way. The woman thanks for the invitation and calls the name of the person sitting at the table, Gidisidor. The man says that Madame can just call him Guido. Madame Fran smiles and says that she and Yun have not seen each other for a long time. She wonders if the girl is doing well. Yunyi replies that she has no problems. Madame Fran sits down and says that the girl responds coldly, as always, but that's what she likes about her. Then Madame Fran gets down to business and asks why she was invited here. Guido says there's a little problem. The spirit beast that Madame Fran sent was killed and became completely useless. Then the woman asks how many knights of the White King died, but Guido says that no one died in the fight with this beast. He bites his nail and says that the fact is that an unknown traveler intercepted the monster. By the time the White King's knights arrived, the beast's spirit was already covered in blood. Madame Fran asks if the spirit of the beast was really bloodied. She says it's a rather unusual expression. Guido says he had to pick up the corpse that the autopsy team took, so he puts out a small object and says he wants Madame to use her magic again to revive the two beasts. Madame says she understands what Guido is driving at and offers him to take the item she got. Guido examines a huge flask and asks what it is. Madame says that at the moment when she received an invitation from Guido, she foresaw what he might ask, so she provides her gift for him. The young man asks what is inside the flask, to which Madame Fran says that there is an army of monsters inside. Guido makes a smile from ear to ear and says that it's just wonderful. Madame Fran says she is glad that he liked her gift. She also clarifies that all monsters inside are of rank B and above. She also borrowed some S rank monsters, so she thinks Guido might need them. Madame Fran says that she borrowed some resources from the laboratory when she left the Empire, and then she restored a small part of them. Madame Fran then asks when Guido is ready to make his next move. The man replies that this will happen in a week, and until then he wants Madame Fran to personally increase the number of perfumes as much as possible. When Madame Fran left the meeting place, Yunyi said that she didn't think her gift would be very useful. Guido said that this gift would be their insurance, because the traveler who dealt with the past creature would be able to interfere again and destroy their plans. The next morning, Massimune recalled the words of the God of Revenge that the young man should find them. His thoughts were distracted by Toa, who was eating meat at that time. The girl asked what was wrong with the young man. Shira said that Massimune looks very pale. The girl asks if he's okay. The young man replied that he felt the same as usual. The girl asks if he is sure, because the young man was just watching fencing practice. Toa added that the young man did not even hold a sword. Then Shira suggested that Massimune might not like practicing anymore. The young man replied that training still brings him pleasure and he feels like he is growing. He says that today he just wants to explore the city. He asks the girls not to worry about it too much. The truth is, he couldn't stop thinking about what happened last night, because there was so much that he couldn't focus on anything else. However, when he watched the training god of Shira and Toa, he realized something. He saw their fight as if in slow motion, as if it was predictable. So what happened last night wasn't just a dream. If he had picked up a sword this morning, he would definitely have done differently than yesterday, so the girls would have started questioning him. Massimune is trying to figure out what excuse he should come up with to avoid training tomorrow. Suddenly his thoughts are interrupted by Toa, who points out the window and asks what it is. Outside the window, a huge man was walking down the street and pulling a small child who had ears and a tail like an animal. Shira apologizes for bothering them, but the girl asks to follow this man immediately. Most likely, this person is a dealer in prohibited goods. Meanwhile, the man brings this beastman and throws him to the ground. He says to take this girl to the cage immediately. The man who was next to him said that the beastman would be appreciated dearly. 
The man told the other to be careful and not to injure the goods. They put the beastman in a cage and tell her to obediently stay there and not make too much noise. The man licks the blade and tells the beastman that she probably doesn't want her ears crippled. Suddenly more people come up to her and say, looking at her, they have a good catch today. Another says that the race of white cats is a very unusual find. Another says that compared to the girl they had the other day, this new animal girl is much better. The man says that their boss is not here right now, so he asks the second one how about they play with her a little now. He says the boss won't notice even if they hurt her. Another man says it's a great idea, and his stress has accumulated over the past few days. The man opens the door and calls the animal girl to him. He tells her not to move, because everything will be over soon. The beastman began to struggle, but the man told her not to worry, because there was nothing to be afraid of. The second asks the man to hurry up, because the boss may return soon. Suddenly one of the men makes a choking sound, and then flew to the other end of the room, breaking the boxes standing there. Massimune shook off his hands. He says he thinks just fainting will be enough for them. The beastman with shining eyes looked at the young man who entered. He turns to her and asks if she is okay. He says he accidentally saw her being taken away here, so he came here to save her. He holds out his hand to her and tells her not to worry, because he won't hurt her, so he offers the girl to get her out of here. After a while, when Massimune and the girl went outside, they were met by Toa and Shira. The girls waved at him. The beast girl asked about Massimune, to which the young man replied that it was his name, and then he asked the girl's name. She said her name was Nemo. Shira came up to her and said that she was pleased to meet him, and then said that her name was Shira. The girl asked if Nemu knew where her home was, to which the baby replied that her home was where her sister was. Shira said that she understood everything and, as he thought, this house is a church. Toa asked about what Shira meant when talking about the church. The girl replied that in fact it is an orphanage, that is, a place where children are temporarily looked after. When she reached one of the shelters, Shira said that it looked like one of their children was there. Massimune inspects the building and thinks it looks more like an old mansion than a church. Nemu opens the door of the building and sees a maidservant there. She screams, calling her sister, and runs into the woman's arms. The girl begins to ask where she disappeared, because her sister was very worried. The girl apologizes and says that she was caught by a scary man, but then Massimune saved her. The sister looks at the people who have entered the church. After a while, sitting at the table and drinking tea, Shira told her sister about what had happened. The woman thanked them for saving him and said she didn't know how she should repay them. Shara told her sister not to worry about it, because they are happy as long as Nemu is fine. The woman says that sometimes she secretly went to her friends. The royal capital is relatively safe and people do not discriminate against beastmen. The woman thought there was nothing to worry about. She turned pale and said that she was mistaken in her guesses, to think that it had fallen into the hands of dealers in prohibited goods when it was supposedly forbidden. Massimune asks Shira about the ban. The girl said that she had omitted this explanation, but the buying and selling of slaves is prohibited in Rashasin and, of course, kidnapping too. However, this is also a fact, but some people are still doing similar things in hidden places. If the Toa had not noticed the abduction in time, then the fate of him would have been completely different. Suddenly Massimune notices something on Nemu's left hand and asks if his sister knows what is on it. The girl looks at the girl in horror. The sister pulls the sleeve of her jacket to him and begins to sob with horror, saying that this simply cannot be. Shira says that this drawing denotes a slave crest, that is, herm, which merchants carve on their goods. In other words, a slave comb is proof of a slave. It's a common thing for male subordinates, but Nemu probably got this crest because she's a beastman. The comb itself does not have a special effect, but it is obvious that those who received the comb refuse to escape. Perhaps it is intended as a chain binding the mind, saying that you belong to another person. Massimune thinks about how many human lives those traitors destroyed. He let Shira deal with it, but he had to kill all of them on the spot. Suddenly, the young man is comforted by Toa and asks if he is okay, because he just made a scary face. Shira tells Massimune not to worry and leave the rest for later. The girl said that she had already contacted Annette and the young man now had nothing to worry about. He said that the girl was absolutely right and everything would be fine. After a while, Massimune and the girls were about to leave. His sister and he went out to check on them. Massimune sat down next to him and told her to be careful for now, and also that she should try not to go out alone anymore. He said goodbye to her, but promised to return tomorrow. Toa asked Massimune if he was really going to visit him again tomorrow, because he had mentioned at parting that he would return to her tomorrow. The young man smiled and said that she was playing with other children as if nothing had happened, so he is sure that when tomorrow comes, she will forget about him. 
However, the next morning, Nemu joyfully ran to Masamune and called him master. The young man asked why Nemu was here, to which the girl replied that she had come here to meet the master. Nemu asked Masamune, calling him master again, where they were going. The young man said that they were heading to the guild. Masamune is staying at Shira's house, but he can't keep going and living there, so he needs to earn some money. He shouted that, as expected from the master, he really is an adventurer. The girl says she will go too. Suddenly Masamune calls Toa. Toa and Shira stood with stone faces and looked at the young man. Toa asked him, saying that she suddenly wondered why Nemu called him master. Masamune started screaming for the girls to listen to him, because he didn't ask her to call herself that. Toa with a narrowed look asked if this was really the case. Then the girl turns to the animal girl and asks why she calls Masamune a master. The girl says that her mother taught her this word. A woman says that when someone saves your life, you should love that person for the rest of your days. Nemu says that the master saved her and therefore he is her master. Suddenly, a familiar merchant comes up to them and asks if these guys really know him. The animal girl begins to scream and joyfully says, introducing the merchant Masamune that this young man is a master to him. The woman makes a very strange expression on her face. Masamune understands that this is becoming problematic. After a while, Masamune, Toa and Shira explained to the merchant what had happened to him. The woman examined her hand and said that she understood everything and it must have been very cruel. She pats him on the head and says that she is very glad that Masamune and the girls saved this baby. He often comes to play in this woman's store, so she is like her own daughter. The woman says that if it were possible, she would like to hit those who tried to harm him, but still she can't believe that the day of the send-off will come so soon. The woman tells Masamune that Nemu chose him as her master, so he should not let her down. If something happens to him, the woman will drop everything and come to beat the young man. Then a man comes into the shop. He said he was trying to find Shira. The girl recognized him as Edward. The girl says that she sees that the man still uses this appearance in public. The girl asks if the man is really worried about this. Edward replies that no one will even think that he is one of the Knights of the White King and, after all, this is a normal appearance. Then, taking the topic aside and looking at Masamune and Toa, Edward asks what kind of people are next to Shira. The girl introduces him to Masamune, Toa and Nemo. Edward asks if they really are the ones about whom there are so many rumors in the ranks of the White Knights. He takes off his hat and makes a bow apologizing for the late introduction. The man says his name is Edward Scotch and he is one of the Knights of the White King. The man also says that he is very glad to meet you. Shira then asks why the man was trying to find her. The man takes out a roll of paper and says that this is a message from Reinhardt. Shira unwraps the package and can't believe her eyes. Edward says it's the king's request. A basilisk appeared in the Vic and not only. Edward explains to Shara that the basilisk appeared in a barn belonging to Boreas, a friend of his majesty. Toa is interested in the basilisk. Nemu says she knows about basilisks too. The basilisk, according to him, is a huge snake. Shara asks why the order was given to her. Edward says he doesn't know that. He was only ordered to give her a written order. He is sure that his majesty has his own reasons for choosing Shira. Then he breaks into the conversation and asks Shira for a favor while they are here. The woman says that she needs basilisk tear glands and a bag of poison, as well as large fangs, because she doesn't have them either. The woman says she will be grateful if they collect them for her after they kill the basilisk. Masamune says that he will go with Shira on this task, and if a young man goes, then Toa is also with him. The girl asks if everything will be alright. The young man says it's time to repay her for letting them stay in her house. Toa also says that everything is fine. The woman offers to take him with her, but Masamune says that she is still a child. The girl starts crying and says that the master is really going to leave him. The young man crouches on one knee and says that they are going to fight an evil monster and asks if the girl understands this. Nemu says that she wants to be useful to the master. The woman tells the young man not to worry, because despite his appearance, Nemu is a healer and much stronger than Masamune. A young man thinks that he was recently caught by traitors. He looks at the sad eyes of the animal girl and says that he will allow her to do this only this time. After a while, Masamune's group rode in a wagon to complete tasks. Meanwhile, Shara was angry and said that the king was a real expatriate. The king sent her to get an ordinary basilisk, because he could have sent someone from the guild, not to mention that the petition came through the guild. The girl sees no reason to send her personally. Masamune told the girl to calm down and think about this assignment as a favor for Sharon. Masamune himself thinks why Shira cares so much about this. Suddenly Toa translated the topic and asked him what the animal girl could do. 
Can she use magic? The girl replies that she can't use magic, but she can make a cat's fist. Masamune wonders what it is. The girl is surprised that the young man does not know what it is. The girl gets up from her seat and says that she will explain to the master saying that the cat's fist is, but before she can finish, she realizes that she herself does not know what it is. Nemu says that she only knows that this is the art of the beastmen which was passed on to them, cats. Masamune wants to know more. Shira explains that the martial art of beastmen is something that beastmen specialize in well. She also clarifies that each kind of beastman has its own martial art. In his homeland, this martial art is called the cat's fist. Masamune understands that, it turns out, this is a military technique. Masamune then asks Nemu if she really doesn't know how to use magic. Nemu says that she does not know how to use magic, but Nemu is a sorceress, if she is taught magic, she will be able to use it. Shara is surprised by this, because if a human cat knows how to use magic, then this is a special class of cat people. The girl says that she has heard that this is an innate class, it belongs to the highest ranks. Masamune asks that if a beastman has an innate class, then there may be an unborn one. Shira says that in some classes the level increases with age. She says that she was an ordinary knight, and now she is an elite knight. The young man asks if he can really become a cleric after a healer. Shira apologizes and says it's impossible because clerics are an innate class. She says that the development paths of almost every class are already known. But as far as she knows, the healer class is not developing. Masamune understands that he will remain a healer forever. Nemu asks if her master is really a healer. The young man confirms this and says that this is why he uses only healing and supportive magic. Nemu raises his hand and says that the master should not be sad, because Nemu will protect the master. And the master saved him, so the master is not weak. Then Nemu asks when they will get to the Vic. Shira says she thinks it's tomorrow. Shira says she will have to spend the night in the wagon. Masamune realizes that the road is further than he thought. Vic turns out to be quite far away. Masamune asks if it's okay that they left the capital. Shara replies that everything is fine, because Edward will inform everyone upstairs. She also told Annette everything just in case. Masamune wonders when she made it. Yesterday he saw a girl talking to a ring. He asks if Shara's ring really allows her to communicate from a distance. The girl shows the ring and says that everything is exactly like that. Every royal white knight has such a ring. The young man says that he also has such a ring. He says he took it from someone, but didn't use it. It is very convenient in terms of the fact that you can contact others, regardless of the distance. Shira replies that her ring works in the kingdom, and Masamune's ring can work outside of it. The young man says that according to the words of the one who gave it, everything is exactly like that. The girl examines the ring and says that it is very expensive and probably made of the purest materials. Toa asks who gave this ring to Masamune. The young man says that he met this man briefly. He says that a man suddenly attacked him, and he responded in kind, so suddenly this man offered to become his comrade. The young man says that after seeing him, the aura of that person became aggressive and when he thought it was over, his magic did not allow Masamune to escape. He also said that he was from some organization and invited me to join them, told me to think about the offer and gave me a ring. Shira said that it all sounds very suspicious, and then asked if this unknown person had said the name of the organization. Masamune thought for a while and said that the organization was called Dragon Heart. Shara shuddered and was very surprised. Shara asked if this unknown person really said that. Masamune asked her if she knew anything about this organization. The girl said she thought everyone knew about them. Dragon Heart is known for preying on politicians. They killed many, those in power, guilty of theft, murder and the like. Most countries have put a considerable bounty on their heads. Masamune remembers that the stranger did mention something like that, for example, about the destruction of a rotten top or something. Shara said that they probably were. She told about the case that made the Dragon Heart famous all over the world, occurred in the Kingdom of Torrent. Queen Priva, the Lady of Torrent, committed mass genocide in pursuit of the idea of a beautiful kingdom. She killed more than half of the kingdom's population. Most of the victims were elderly. Masamune asked if that was why the Dragonheart organization had come for her. Shara replied that it was so, but they killed not only Queen Priva, they destroyed everyone connected with the queen, and among the dead were children. Masamune asks if Toa knows about this. The girl replied that she knew about it, but not as much as Sheer. She accidentally overheard her parents talking about their acquaintance, carpenter or something like that. He created the Dragon Heart organization. Shira asks Masamune and wonders what about this unknown's offer. The young man replies that he doesn't know yet. He doesn't even know when they'll meet again, but it doesn't matter anyway. 
it's useless to think about it until they see each other, because now they don't even know where this organization is. Still, it's very surprising to be invited by them. Basimune remembers that the three were going to visit Greyburg. He wonders what they're doing there right now. At this time, in the kingdom of Greyburg, near the border, the guards noticed three unknown people. They ordered them to stop and take off their hoods. These people were the three who met Massimune at the very beginning of his journey. They belong to the Dragonheart organization. Greyburk is a kingdom with a huge territory. There is a checkpoint at the gate to Greyburk and another one in front of the main gate to the castle grounds. There are also several villages outside the town, which is protected by the castle. There are several more checkpoints there, so it was considered impossible to enter the kingdom undetected. One of the strangers who defused the guards takes off his hood and addresses his comrade, saying that he was absolutely right that these gates are almost not guarded. Another says that few people are trying to pass through here and if they are required, then most likely it will be merchants or travelers. The girl says that it's not enough to put only two guards here. The man replies that for sure everyone is busy fighting demons. However, last time there was more security. Having said that, behind the backs of the three strangers, the sound of horses' hooves was heard. In the end, they were cleverly taken into a ring and surrounded. Suddenly, a horse with a rider approaches the strangers. The rider said that the knights surrounding the trio had no chance and they had to retreat. This rider was an elderly man with a long beard. He said he would take care of the uninvited guests himself. One of the intruders addresses an elderly man and calls him grandfather. The man says that he and Alford have not seen each other for a long time. He also says he is glad to see him alive and well. However, he sees that the young man has decided to get mixed up with the villains standing nearby. His Highness will be saddened by this news. The young man asks the man to stop pretending, saying that he continues to pretend as always. The man says that it seems to him that Alford decided not to return home. He menacingly asks what business he may have in this city, because this country has no reason to contact him like that. A dark-haired young man steps forward and asks permission to introduce himself. His name is Zeke. In short, they were informed that heroes were being called in Greyburg. This is forbidden magic that requires great sacrifices. As far as the young man knows, there is no other way of summoning, except sacrifice. The man says that Zeke came here to get an answer to this question. He replies that he is not going to discuss it, so he just asks to answer his question. He says that this magic will cause wars. Before that happens, they will bring death to everyone involved, quickly and accurately. The man says that the young man expresses himself very straightforwardly. He also says not to be so impatient. Zeke says it's only a matter of time before it all spreads around the world. The consequences of the magic of summoning heroes are not so easy to hide. The man says that Zeke should see for himself. However, he did not say that he would let them pass. Zeke is sure that this means that the man will resist. He says that in this case the man will die here. He calls the man Albert Morlow. The man calls Zeke a brat and says that he knew about him from the very beginning. The young man asks his comrades to move away, because he will deal with it himself. Comrade Zika asks him to be very careful, because despite the appearance of the man, he still has the class of a sage. Zeke tells the young man not to worry, because he will not give up his position in front of the great wizard known as the Magician of the Forest. The man says that he is very sorry, because the trio would have had a chance if they had attacked all three of them. Zeke says he'll do fine on his own. He says that Zeke seems to underestimate him extremely, and then calls the Dragon Heart an organization full of fools. He gives his name and swears that he will put an end to Zeke's life. Zeke, meanwhile, summons his dragon power and attacks Albert Marlowe. After a while, the entire battlefield was covered with huge trees. Albert Marlowe was lying in the roots of the trees all bloody. The man said that he would never have thought that he would be defeated. He turned to Zeke and asked if he was definitely human. He assumed that the young man was a dragon because he had once seen a dragon in his youth. Zeke says he sees no reason to answer this question. The man laughs and replies that the young man does not even have time to answer the dying old man. Zeke sits down next to him and asks him to ask again. He asks the man a question about whether the ritual of summoning heroes was really carried out in Greyburg. The man closes his eyes and says that the young man already knows the answer. He adds that there is no smoke without fire, but all evidence of the ritual has been destroyed, so Zeke will not be able to find anything. The man admits that they performed the summoning ritual a month ago, and during this time you can do a lot, so the traces of magic have long since dissipated. Zeke gets up and says that it doesn't matter, because Albert has just acknowledged the ritual of summoning heroes, so that's enough. The man says that what Zeke and his comrades are going to do is not called justice. It looks like a massacre for no reason. Zika is offended by the words about justice. He says it's not a matter of justice or lynching. 
because it's not about whether they believe it or not. Albert then turns to Alford and asks him if this is really what he wanted. He asks if Alford feels anything inside himself, seeing a man in such a state, and then wonders where the good Alford has gone. The young man replies that there is no point in appealing to his feelings, because from the very beginning all people meant absolutely nothing to him, so he feels only disgust. He also adds that Albert and Greyberk not only started a war with demons, but also engaged in forbidden magic, sacrificing their subordinates. He also says that they are all just fools. He says with disgust that this country has come to an end. Albert replies that they are not stupid and that all people should do this, otherwise there is no point. Alford turns around, but in the wake says that maybe it's luck to die with such thoughts. He says that the conversation is over, and then orders the man to die quickly. Albert laughs and says that to say such words to a dying old man is cruel. Lying on the roots of the trees, he finally says that he sees that Alford is no longer the prince he once knew. At this time, she ran to her master and said that everything looks just amazing. She was talking about the big market they're going through right now. Vasimune and his group reached the Vic. He was amazed by a large number of people. Shara said that the city is called a shopping center, so there are probably bigger crowds here. Nanwu looks at the beautiful goods and tells Masamune that she really wants to buy these beautiful things. The young man replies that if they have already arrived at the Vic, then you can buy several goods. Shira suggests visiting the farm first, and she suggests conducting an excursion after they finish their work here. After a while, arriving at the farm, Toa noticed a strange animal. She said she didn't want to believe that this animal was called a Wallstein because it didn't look cute at all. Nasimune tells the girl to hurry up and keep up. Finally they reached home. Shara knocked on the door, but no one answered her. Toa assumed that no one seemed to be at home. But suddenly she noticed a large bunch of people. A crowd of people stood at a huge barn and discussed something. Someone asked someone to give up, and someone said that they were scared every day. People stood and questioned one man. They said that according to the information, he should have gotten rid of someone long ago. Others said that you can't just give up and give up this place. Others asked him to sell his farm and live in silence. They questioned the owner of the farm named Bori Vic. The man in a panic asked the residents to wait a little longer, because he sent a request to the guild in the capital. The woman shouted that Boreas was talking about it yesterday, so we can assume that they are not going to come here. The man replied that he was sure that help would come today. Masamune realized that these people are very cruel. Suddenly Shara screamed for them to stop and asked for a moment of attention. She said she was from the capital and had been sent to destroy the basilisk. The girl introduced herself that her name was Shira. Borea's Vic was formed by the fact that the girl is an adventurer. The man was happy and asked everyone to see that the adventurers from the guild had finally arrived here, so now they would be fine. People began to disperse and were indignant why the man could not say that the adventurers would arrive today, because they would not have made so much noise if they had known. Borea's Vic was shaking hands with Shira. At that moment, a man was looking at them. He spat and turned around, which attracted Masamune's attention very much. She said she smelled something. Masamune asked her what was the matter, but the girl replied that there was a strange smell in the air. Then they looked after the man. The man was still shaking hands with Shira and was glad that they had finally come. The girl said that they were a little late on the way. The man asked if they would really kill the basilisk. Masamune interrupted them and said that they would finish it today because he wanted to explore the city again. The man asked the panicked young people to wait. He said he was very grateful to them, but the basilisk is a rank a monster. He says he was also an adventurer once, but with all due respect he thinks they shouldn't be in such a hurry. Shira says that there is no need to worry, because she guarantees that everything will go smoothly, because Mr. Masamune is here. The young man thought that, of course, he was going to cope with this today, but Shara somehow relies too much on him, and after all, this task was entrusted to her. Plus, she also blabbed his name. Shira offers to inspect the barn and then asks if it really belongs to Bori. The man gives a positive answer. Shira calls Masamune and gives him the keys to the barn. They approach the barn together with him, and the girl says that she did not imagine it. The baby says that the barn smells exactly the same. Masamune says that she is really talking about the smell of a basilisk. Nemu replies that it smelled exactly the same from a man in rich clothes who was here recently. Boreas sits down next to him and asks her if she is really talking about that man with a wart under his nose. The girl gives a positive answer. Masamune asks the man if he knows anything about this person. Boreas says that his name is Mr. August and most likely it is him. Masamune asks if Boreas knows him. The man says that when he sent a request to the capital, August came and said that it was necessary to get rid of the basilisk. August is a merchant who once settled in this city a long time ago. 
Shira asks if the merchant really wanted to get rid of the basilisk. Boreas replies that he wanted to get this land as a reward. Boreas Vic said that he found this offer very strange, so he refused August, because this land was passed down from generation to generation. Massimune says that he understood everything, and then suggests that August is involved in all this. Shira also says that this is probably how it is. Basilisks usually live deep in the forest, so it is very suspicious that he decided to make his nest here. The girl says that August probably just wanted to get this land for himself. Boreas does not believe his ears and tries to understand why he would go so far. Massimune says it's a good thing they took him with them, otherwise they wouldn't have noticed the smell. Toa praises the girl in an excellent job. Massimune says that if that's the case, then it's better not to kill the basilisk, but just drive it out. Shara offers to simply stun him and take him to the forest until he wakes up. The young man sees this as a great idea. Massimune opens the lock and unlocks the door, but sees three huge basilisk heads inside. He locks the door and says there are three basilisks inside. Shira is surprised and says that the request mentioned only one basilisk. The man says that there was one basilisk there yesterday, but Shara is sure that there can't be three of them there overnight. The girl says that just a drop of basilisk venom is fatal and no one will want to take on a task with three basilisks if there is no high reward. She also says that the rank of the task would not have changed, but the reward is very strong. Boreas clasps his hands and asks the adventurers for forgiveness. He says there were three of them from the very beginning. Mr. August demanded to show what Boreas wrote in the assignment, so he had to lie. If people found out that there were three basilisks inside, they would go to extreme measures. The man also understands that the adventurers will not take up the murder of three basilisks, but he could not just sit idly by. Nasimune asks Shira that if he cuts off their heads, will these monsters die? The girl gives a positive answer. The young man says that the plan is changing and they will kill all the basilisks. He also remembers that Sharon still needs the materials from the basilisks. Nasimune says he can do it alone, but no one should approach the barn. Nemu started shouting that it was very dangerous, because the young man was just a healer. Nasimune tells the girl not to worry, because he will finish them quickly. He thinks that since he needs materials, he cannot use decomposition, because there will simply be nothing left of the monsters, so he will have to use a sword. The young man enters the barn and is greeted by three huge basilisks. He remembers a technique with which he can kill three opponents at once. He finds the right technique. It is the speed of God using the style of the King of Beasts, that is, the sword of the abyss of the King of Beasts. In an instant, he cuts off the heads of three monsters and goes outside as if nothing had happened. In an instant, Nemu, Shira, Toa and Borevik looked at him in dead silence. She was very happy with him and called the master amazing, because he really coped quickly. Masamune said that he and Shira needed to collect materials because Sharon needed tonsils, venom glands and large fangs. The girl replies that she will start right away. Toa turns to Masamune and says that these basilisks were not dangerous. The young man asks what the Toa means, to which the girl replies that they were trained. Suddenly the merchant August runs out to them and asks what they have done. He says the basilisks belong to the city. Boreas Vic asks if the merchant was really behind all this. Suddenly a man appeared behind August. He asked which of these people was Boreas. He says his head will make a great pirouette when he blows it off with his sword. Then the man saw the corpses of three basilisks and asks why his pets are now lying dead. August points to Massimune's group and says that it was they who killed his basilisks. The man examines the whole group of people and points to the Toa, asking if she really killed his basilisks. Then he looks at Shira and says that her magic is also strong, and then offers to kill all the men first. As for the women, he says that he will first cut off their limbs, and then drag them to the tavern to work out the death of his pets. August laughs and says that Boreas is to blame for everything because it was necessary to accept his offer. Boreas asks why the merchant needed his land. August spreads his hands and says that he wants to build a luxurious mansion. He will enjoy life watching the beautiful city, because this is what any merchant dreams of. Boreas Vic calls August a pathetic man, but the merchant replies that no one cares about the words of a weakling. He also says that he could have paid if Boreas had given him the land voluntarily, so he wouldn't have had to kill anyone if the man hadn't hired these adventurers. The man laughs and tells Boreas that it's over, because he will die here. The man with the sword told Augustus that two of them were strong, so he would have to pay the warrior handsomely for this job. August says he wasn't going to cheat. He says he will pay twice as much if he kills them all, and if at least one remains alive, the man will be left without money. 
The mercenary asks who August takes him for, because his name is Gordon. The man comes up and asks who will be the first, so he asks everyone to decide for themselves. Toa comes forward and says that she will be the first. Gordon smiles and asks if the girl really wants to challenge him alone, so the second girl can join too. Shira comes forward and says she will join too. Masamune asks what the two of them are doing now. Together they say that Mr. Masamune should not interfere in this fight and stand behind them. The young man is surprised, and Gordon says that he does not like it. Gordon says he doesn't like it because he hates people like Masamune who hide behind women. He looks at him and wants to kill him first. Meanwhile, Toa and Shira have already attacked the man. However, he blocked their attack with his broadsword. The man said that the girls are very nimble, because, apparently, they want to play with him so much. In an instant, he pushes them away with his lunge. Masamune realizes that he is very strong. The man attacks the Toa and says that he will play with them and will be able to satisfy them. At that moment, Shara rushed at him, but Gordon was going to hit her with his knee in response. Shara quickly realized and covered herself with her hand. Gordon was surprised that she was able to repel this attack. He says that is expected from the King of the White Knights. The girl says that the man confused her with someone, but he replied that Shira does not know how to lie. It's not clear to him yet which of the two of them it is, but if he plays around a little more, he'll understand. He tells the story of Borea's farm, saying that this land used to belong to King Arnold, the ruler of Rastasim. He's still a king, and he wouldn't send an ordinary adventurer here because his friend Borea's Vic is in trouble. Shira gets into a fighting stance and says that this is just a meaningless assumption. She attacks him, but the man evades. Gordon tisks and tells the girl that she doesn't know how to lie at all. He attacks her, Shara manages to crouch down, and then makes a multi-point lunge, but Gordon blocks them with his sword. Then he says that he knew that Shira was the King of the White Knights. Shira jumps back and tells the girl about a great job. August looks at the man. He is all toasted holding onto his sword, and then with the roar of a real beast activates his berserker ability. Shara notices the magic of darkness in this spell. Masamune understands that the girl is scared and it can be assumed that Gordon used some kind of forbidden magic. Gordon says that the White King probably knows how dangerous this magic is. It was the first time he was beaten like that, but now it's over. He reincarnates and says that he is now invincible. Masamune stands aside and says that this form looks dangerous. Gordon starts shouting at Masamune to shut up and not dare to get in, because he will play with the girls first. Shira rushes forward, but Toa shouts at her to stop, but Shira did not listen to her and attacked the monster but her rapier broke on Gordon's armor. The man says that he is very sorry, and then hits the girl with his fist and she flies into a tree and crashes into him. He approaches her and says that, apparently, she does not understand what kind of magic it is. Right now, her physical and magical attacks are nothing to him. He swings to hit the girl, but Toa appears from behind and uses lightning speed. Toa's eyes light up from lightning. The man turns around, but the girl uses the thunderstorm sword and cuts Gordon in the image of a berserker. The man says that this is simply impossible, and Shara looks at it all in shock. A man falls to the ground with a cut body part. Toa gives her hand to Shira and asks if she is safe. Shira says that Toa saved her and then thanks her for always covering for them. Suddenly Gordon stands behind the girl. No one understands how he can still stand on his feet. Gordon repeats that he said he was invincible now. He uses true resurrection magic. The man uses the cursed great spear. Toa rushed to cover Shira, but in an instant Masamune appeared in front of the girls and used his spell. August looked around and tried to figure out what had happened. Suddenly Gordon's hand falls at his feet. Masamune asks if he really wants the same. Masamune asks Boreas what they should do with August. The man immediately rushed to Boreas and began to beg him to let him go. He swears he won't cause him any more problems. Boreas replied that this land had been passed down from generation to generation and he would not give it to someone who acts only for his own selfish purposes. If Augustus promises never to appear on this earth again, then he will spare his life. August makes a promise and asks for forgiveness. After a while, Boreas says that he has collected the materials. Shira thanks the man. Boreas replies that he doesn't need thanks because he didn't do anything special. The man also says that, unfortunately, he will not be able to pay more than the amount stated in the order, but he can give something else. Imiditsong gives the bag and asks if they will take it in return. Bori says that the bag contains the meat of the steins he grows, as well as other high-quality materials from the Javishtines. He asks you to accept all this. Bori is apologizes and asks for forgiveness, but that's all he can offer. Masamune looks at the joyful girls and tells the man not to worry, because this is a very good reward. Borivik says that they all defended this ranch today, so he will forever be grateful to them. 
He thanks them again from the bottom of his heart. Walking along the road, Shira asks Masamune if he really mastered the sword, because when she taught him fencing, the young man could not do anything. But when it came to the basilisk, Masamune quickly defeated him. Masamune understands that he got this skill after that day. However, he says that it is difficult to explain. Shira says she believes the young man. She also says that the young man clearly attracts trouble. Masamune apologizes for this. Then they are going to shop in the city, so they go shopping. After a while, Masamune's group was at the local huge market. Masamune noticed how Toa was carrying a bag of meat. He pointed out to her that she was looking at this meat with a very hungry look. Toa replied that there was nothing like that and that, on the contrary, Nemu was behaving strangely. Masamune asks her not to talk into his ears, because he's alright. Toa said that Nemu is in that direction. Masamune asked the girl if she liked anything. Nemu says the necklaces are very beautiful. The merchant asks if she liked these necklaces. The girl says she liked them. The man replies that the girl has a good eye. These necklaces contain a crystal stone from Polstera. Masamune picks up the necklace and examines it. The man says that now the Polstera country no longer exists, but they can buy these necklaces because they won't regret it. Shira says that crystal stones from Polstera are very famous. Initially it is blue, but over time it changes its color depending on the magical power of the owner. The merchant says that the frequency of the color depends on the quality of the magic power of the owner. Every time he impatiently wants to see what color this stone will become. There are rumors among merchants that with the help of this stone you can find a great magician. Masamune wonders if he should buy this necklace as a souvenir. He asks how much these necklaces cost. The merchant replies that one is worth 3,000, then Masamune asks for three. After a while, he puts one necklace on his neck. The girl thanks the young man. Masamune asks her not to lose the necklace. The girl replies that she will treasure it. Then Toa comes up to them and asks Masamune to put her necklace on her too. The young man blushed, but still put the necklace on Toa. The girl raises her face and thanks the young man. Suddenly Masamune flashes and blushes all over. Shara also blushed and closed her eyes. Masamune, in a panic, offers to help Shira put on the necklace too. The girl says she can do it herself. After a while, Masamune notices the sign of a liquor store. Shira says it looks like an alcohol store. They decide to go inside. He squints at the fact that there is a strong smell of alcohol inside. The merchant tells the visitors welcome, and then asks if they are looking for something specific. Masamune replies that this is not the case. Then the man points to expensive drinks and says that he recommends these particular copies. Masamune understands that this will be a noticeable blow to his wallet. The man says that the drink called Old Geld is no longer available. Masamune asks if it's wine. The man in shock asks what, really, the young man does not know about this drink. Old Geld is a brand that also bears the name of Ghost Wine. It is no longer being produced. Even the merchant does not know how many such bottles are left in the world. Masamune understands that he has already seen this label and name somewhere. Suddenly he remembers the drink he found in the dungeon at the beginning of his journey. He takes out a bottle and asks if it's really old geld. The man grabs Masamune by the hand and asks in horror if he can see. The young man gets scared and agrees. The man examines the bottle very carefully with the help of instruments. Toa asks and says if this is the wine that Masamune drank and even gave her a taste. The young man agrees. The man, after examining the bottle, says that it is clearly not a fake. The young man asks if he wants to taste this wine. The man in shock asks if he really can. Then he pours some into a glass, shakes it in the glass to saturate it with oxygen. Then he sniffs it and tastes it a little. Suddenly it dawned on him and he says that this drink is really an old gel. The man says that as a child he tried the old gel in his father's office and was very surprised. It was a long time ago, but he never forgot this taste. He looks at the bottle and says that without a doubt, this is a real original, old geld. The man asked Masamune where he got it. The young man replies that he got it in the dungeon. The man thought about it, and then clenched his hand into a fist and asked if Masamune would be able to give him this drink. The man says that of course he is not asking for it for free. He is ready to pay for it as much as he wants. Then he asks how about 10 million. The man takes out his most expensive product and says that Masamune can also take it. He says that the young man can take everything that is in this store. Masamune asks the man to wait a bit. Masamune says it's too much for one bottle. The man shouts that this is not enough. He has been in this business for a long time, so he will speak frankly with him. It was rumored that such a wine no longer exists. Any connoisseur of alcohol would like to try it. It can be estimated at a hundred million, and the aristocrats will give a billion. The young man realized that he liked such an expensive drink and did not suspect. The man says that this is why the young man can ask anything for him, 
but 30 million is the limit for him now. Then the man remembers that he has connections and he will be able to sell wine directly to the aristocrats, so he will be able to earn at least a billion. He says he will give half of the proceeds to the young man. Massimune understands that this man really really needs this wine, and he has about a hundred bottles and barrels in storage. Two, a lot. The seller shows that he is not lying, so nothing bad will happen. The young man says that 30 million. If a man can pay this amount right away, then he will give this bottle right now and, of course, he will not give up half after selling the bottle. The man couldn't believe his ears. He didn't think that the young man would agree to sell this bottle. He asks to wait a second, and then comes in with a bag. The man puts the first 5 million and says he took it from the bank. Massimune understands that there are banks in this world too. Then the man says he will bring more. He puts 30 million in front of him, and then, after receiving a bottle with an expensive drink, begins to cry with happiness. Shira is surprised, looking at the money that Massimune turns out to have had an old geld. The young man asks the girl if she really knows about this drink too. The girl says that her father is the owner of Budo Vineyards. A male merchant asks Sheru if they come from the Ekarat family. The girl says that she is the daughter of Brown Ekarat. As a child, she was often told that Old Jelt was the best wine in the world. The man says that this is absolutely true. Then he tells Massimune that he will definitely return with the proceeds. He puts the bottle in the drawer and asks what the young man is going to do now. Massimune remembers that Shira's rapier broke. The girl says she is ashamed of it. This rapier is given to every knight of the White King. So in other words, it was forged especially for her. So who knows how much she will have to pay for a new one. The young man offers to buy the girl a new weapon right now. Shira says she won't be able to repay the debt. The young man asks her not to worry, and then says that he will buy new clothes for Toa and him. Toa asks about clothes, to which the young man replies that a girl cannot wear the same outfit every day. The male salesman said that he knows a suitable store, so he tells them that he will see the guys off. Massimune thanks the man. Shira remembers Mr. Massimune's sword and calls it very strange. The young man takes it out and says that it is called a snake blade and he also got it from the dungeon. The man asks to take a look at this blade, and then tells Massimune not to use the word dungeon too lightly. The young man is interested in the reason for such a ban, to which the man replies that if he really got this blade from the dungeon, then everything is serious. This sword may turn out to be legendary or mythical, and in this case the young man's life may be in danger. Massimune asks if the weapons really have ranks too. Shira says that all materials, weapons, wasters and monsters have ranks. The ordinary rank is the lowest, and the highest rank is fantastic. She also says, by the way, that there is no standard of value for items that are below the usual rank, for example, goblin teeth. The man asks to listen to him, and then says that this sword should be taken for evaluation. He understood the rank of this sword, but they had better see for themselves to be sure. The evaluation of the weapon can be carried out in the same store that he will show. He also says that Massimune will be able to decide for himself whether he will be safe if he keeps this sword for himself. The young man thinks that this sword belonged to Shayon, so his rank cannot be low. He decides to take this opportunity to find out the rank of the sword. Then he asks the man to guide them. After a while, they arrived at Cook's store. The man said it was a general store run by a large cook company, but in fact this store specializes in artifacts. Massimune's group went into the store and began to look at various products. The young man realized that there are a lot of things here that belong to a really large company. She was glad that everything was shining around her, and then ran through the expanses of the store. Toa asked her to stop and then ran after her. The man put the sword on the counter and asked to evaluate it. He told Massimune that he would wait here for the results, and the young man could look around the area. Massimune said that he would go and look for Toa with him, and Shira could look at a new rapier at that moment. The girl asked if she could really do it. Massimune said that let the purchase of a new rapier serve instead of paying for accommodation, so he would get something in return, and the girl would not be so embarrassed. After a while, Massimune saw Toa looking at the armor. The girl said she didn't find anything special. She already has a sword, but the armor that is provided here is too heavy, and she wants something lighter. A consultant girl breaks into their conversation and says that perhaps this outfit will suit the girl. It represents a light armor made of wyvern scales. The armor has a rare rank, so it is very durable. Massimune thinks that a rare rank is not very valuable, but I would like something better. Besides, this armor will not suit the Toa at all. The young man notices the curtain and asks what is there. 
The consultant says that there is a department of items of royal rank and before they are allowed there, you need to check their solvency. The girl asks if they have enough finances. The young man shows the money and says whether 10 million is enough. The girl immediately apologizes and asks to follow her into this room. The young man understands from her reaction that the royal rank is not so expensive. Going inside, Massimune realizes that the atmosphere in this place is completely different. Toa asks the young man if he really wants to spend all 10 million. She says that there is no need to spend so much, even if it is a royal rank. The young man says that there should be armor of the highest quality. He doesn't know how much it really should cost, so he may not spend it all, so he suggests looking around first. The consultant says it's the Guardian's Hagoromo. It was created by a senior alchemist from cloth and materials of royal rank. It is very durable and elastic, first of all, lightweight. Toa asked what the young man thought. He said it kind of fits. This will suit a girl much better than heavy armor. They decide to take this thing. Massimune asks the price and they tell him the figure of one and a half million. Toa asks the young man if he is sure. Massimune replies that there is no problem and they will buy it. Toa is taken away to try on the armor and Massimune noticed Nemu, who was looking at the showcases. The girl said that there are a lot of things around that she can't choose. Massimune asks the consultant and asks if they have a reservation for the child. He is shown a mithril t-shirt and told that it can be worn under a different armor. This thing is the work of an elven master seamstress, so it is expensive, 2 million. It has been improved with the help of magic and changes size to suit its owner. The young man asks what rank this thing has. He is told that the t-shirt has a royal rank. Vasimune tells him that this t-shirt can be worn under clothes and it will protect her. The girl says that the armor is very expensive. Vasimune replies that it's a small price to pay to protect him. The girl screamed that she understood and then happily thanked the young man. Vasimune told her to change and try on a t-shirt. Then Toa came out to Vasimune with a new thing. The young man was amazed by her beauty. The girl asked the young man's opinion. The young man, embarrassed, said that this outfit really suits Toa. He asked where her new clothes came from, to which the girl replied that the consultant had picked up new clothes and said that it was very becoming to her. Then he came out to Massimune and said that she had changed her clothes. The girl was wearing a different jacket. Massimune asked where she got these clothes from, to which the girl replied that a consultant picked them up for her. Nemu noted that there is an ear compartment in the hood. Then a man came out and said that they were made specifically for the girl's appearance so she can hear perfectly even with a hood. Massimune noted the unusual service. Meanwhile, Shara was looking at a beautiful rapier with a snowflake next to the hilt. Massimune suddenly approached her and asked if Shira liked this rapier. The girl said that she did not like her at all, to which the young man thought that it was very easy to understand what was on the mind of this girl. The consultant said that this rapier, made of unicorn horn, is from the Arda Mountains. The young man asked about these mountains. The girl said that the Arda Mountains are a mountain range in Majern with a height of 10,000 meters. Majern is a cold land where snow has been lying for hundreds of years. Most of the monsters don't even approach there because of the cold. They say that unicorns live in these mountains. The magical power of ice accumulates in the body of this unicorn, and the horn has the largest accumulation. Unicorns living in such harsh conditions have a high rank, so it is obvious that the rank of materials from them is also high. Massimune asks if they are really being hunted right in the mountains. The girl replies that occasionally unicorns descend to the foot of the mountains. Of course, this rapier was forged by the best blacksmiths, so its price is 5 million. From this figure, sweat appeared on Shira's face. Massimune asked Shira if the girl was using ice magic. If so, this rapier will suit her perfectly. The girl agreed, but said that this weapon is too expensive. She's not an experienced knight yet, so it's worth finding something cheaper. Massimune then asks if he should buy it for himself. Shara says it's obviously the most beautiful rapier. The shine of the blade, the design of the guard and the handle, everything in it is fine. In addition, it contains ice magic, so it is an ideal weapon. After listening to her, he says that he will take her to Sheer, and then gives 5 million to the consultant. The girl screamed and said that it was not necessary to do so, because she did not deserve such an expensive gift. The young man smiles and says that it's too late to dissuade him, because he has already bought a rapier. Then he gives it to the girl. The girl hugs the blade and thanks Massimune, saying that now it will be her most expensive blade. After a while, the man from the wine shop gives the snake blade to Massimune. The young man asks how the assessment went. The man replied that he was told that they could not determine the value of this sword. Shara assumed that in this case, the blade has a legendary rank. The man replied that it was impossible because the seller said that they could determine the legendary rank. 
This means that the blade has an approximately mythical rank. Shara said it was the first time she had seen such a thing. The man replied that too. Masamune asks if this blade is really a rarity. The man replies that, firstly, no one has seen things of mythical rank or higher for a long time. Without exaggeration, it was believed that they did not exist at all. However, in the ranking system they are at the same time. The existence of equipment of this rank is only a theory, as with monsters of immortal rank. The seller claimed that he had successfully measured, but he could not determine the rank of the item above the legendary, so do not believe his words. Masamune thinks that if this blade used to belong to Shaon, then he expected the rank to be high, but still not that high. The young man remembered Shaon's words when he said that the young man should give this snake sword to the demon girl, because it is special, and it may not suit the young man. He tells Toa to listen to her and asks if she would mind fighting with this sword. The girl takes it and says that it is very valuable and perhaps it would be better to keep it with her. Masamune says that this sword will obviously not suit him. He tells her to judge for herself. He, as a healer, cannot use this sword, so it suits the Toa better. The girl examines the blade and says that they will exchange swords. The man says that the young man is very strange, because he just gives valuable things to other people. Masamune says he doesn't need this treasure. The man sighs and says that either the young man is too generous or too stupid, and Masamune replies that he is an ordinary person. He thinks that maybe he has changed a little after all, because he used to be alone. But now he has met girls, so he is grateful to them from the bottom of his heart. At this time, a huge portrait of Albert Morlow hung in front of the public, and the king stood in front of him. He said Albert Morlow was their friend, sometimes with wisdom and sometimes with strength, but he helped them in their kingdom for a long time. For Greybook, the death of such a magician is simply an irreparable loss. The king says that they can no longer repay him, so what they are about to say in memory of a friend is very important. They were going to keep it a secret from everyone at the beginning. He says that everyone present is grieving with them and everyone is suffering, and if so, then everyone has the right to know the truth. The truth is that Albert Morlow died at the hands of Dragonheart. This organization has challenged the entire kingdom. The king shouts that they swear to all the subjects of the kingdom that all these scoundrels from the organization will suffer a painful death, because this is the only way they will repay the debt of friendship. At this time, at the Ares Kingdom National Academy, there was a girl standing on the training ground number one. She relayed the terrible news to Massimune's classmates that Mr. Albert had died. She said that the Dragonheart organization, criminals who attack politicians and aristocrats, showed up near the borders of the kingdom yesterday. Albert immediately hurried there, but, unfortunately, did not succeed in the battle. She said that she wanted to convey Albert's dying news to the boys and girls, because she was coming here with these thoughts but it seems that she only achieved what she undermined the mood of the teenagers. One of Massimune's classmates, who used to bully him, said that Mr. Albert taught them all magic, and was also kind, even when they did not succeed. He was a good teacher, so they are all sincerely grateful to him, so they all ask to convey his last will. The girl thanks them and says that she is sure that Albert would be proud of the guys. Then she says that they must defeat the Demon King and bring peace to these lands. Being the main motto of Greyburg, it is at the same time Albert's last testament. She says that the boys and girls are the hope of Albert and the whole kingdom, so she asks to lend them her strength. After a while, Siki approaches a young man named Akijo and calls out to the young man. He was asking if Akijo really wasn't listening to what Ares was saying. They all try for the good of the country and train, so Akijo should not shirk his duties. The young man says that he listened to everything, but now he has free time, so he spends it the way he likes, because rest is also important. He looks at Siki and says that he always snaps at him for any reason, so he thought that Hidaka probably felt something like that too. Siki started shouting, telling Akijo to stop telling him something about this dead man. The young man replied that the woman had also come to tell them about the deceased. Siki asked Akijo what he meant by talking about the dead man. Was he really talking about Ares? Akijo asks who he is talking about now then. Siki, of course, is a brute and a bully, but at heart he is an ordinary simpleton, therefore he does not notice. The young man asked what Akijo was talking about. He clarifies what he says about that woman. Most likely, everything is not clean with her last speech either. Siki grabs a classmate by the collar and asks what grounds he has for saying so. The young man asks a counter question and asks why Siki is so fiercely defending this woman. He asks how they all reacted to her story about the old man's death. The naked eye can see that everyone is even more inspired. But in fact a man died and was killed. It was not just anyone who was killed, but a great sage who served the kingdom for decades. So it would be more logical to be sad. 
He removes Siki's hand and asks if it wasn't strange. Every time Ares arrives, he begins with gloomy news that the situation in the kingdom is difficult, or that the people are dying at the hands of demons. Before she leaves, she always says something nice, for example, how much she believes in the guys. Most of the guys immediately rush to train with special zeal, but it did not have any such effect on the girls. Then the old man began to come with his carefree laugh. Now that he is dead, Ares comes and tells them all to fulfill his last wish. It feels like everything is going according to this woman's script. Ikijo says it's all just brainwashing. Suddenly a man comes up to them and asks what is going on here. Siki replies that nothing happened and they were just discussing their future. Siki says they should train even harder for the good of the kingdom. The man slaps him on the shoulder and says he's counting on him. When the teacher left, Ikijo continued, saying that the current Siki just makes him sick, because even before he was not so bad. The young man tells Ikijo to think what he wants, but he will not inform on him. The thing is that Ikijo is very strong, which means he is important to the kingdom. Ikijo notes Siki's remarkable devotion to this place. Then they were interrupted by the girls who were standing nearby and heard everything. One of them shouted for the boys to stop, because everyone was already sick of Ikijo's nagging. Another girl says that once Ikijo was cool, but now he just sucks. Ikijo smiled and said that girls, as he sees, do not change. They can't see beyond their nose. The girls started throwing a tantrum as Ikijo cast the explosion spell. Suddenly something exploded above the girls. Ikijo gave them a threatening look and told them they were like leeches. They always stick to someone and don't lag behind. If he is not suitable for this, then they stick to Siki. He asks who they will stick to after Siki. He says that when they hide behind someone's back, whatever they say, they may not be responsible for the words. If Hidaka was on his revenge, then they would surely laugh at him until they got tired of it themselves. Siki says if Akijo is ashamed to use magic to intimidate, he asks the young man if he is a coward. Akijo replies that no one should, but he should not talk about intimidation. Siki can't stand them, grabs Ikijo by the collar, and then tells him to think properly about who is really wrong. After a while, Ikijo was left alone. He was sitting next to a tree and thought that maybe they had all forgotten something. When Hidaka was exiled, everyone had to see Eri's real face. Condemning him to death, she laughed heartily with that terrible face. She just can't be a good person. He believes that after all, they are just pawns for these people. If they are deemed useless, they will simply be thrown out like Hidaku, but it is likely that they will simply be killed altogether. Ikijo doesn't understand why no one notices this. He remembers Masamune's face and asks if he is still alive somewhere out there. After a while, Masamune and the girls arrived in Radhausen. They immediately went to Sharon's shop and gave her the materials from the basilisk bodies. The woman was surprised that they managed to catch as many as three basilisks, because one is very difficult to cope with, and there are as many as three. The woman turned to him and asked if anything had happened to her, but the girl replied that she was fine. The girl remembered Masamune's words. The young man asked her not to tell anyone that he killed the basilisks. The girl understands that Sharon is also not allowed to say this, so she shouted out that Nemu was keeping a secret. Masamune decided to change the subject and asked what the woman would do with the ingredients from the basilisk. The woman replied that she would prepare a secret potion. She asks them to wait a bit. After a while, the woman came out with the drug. Masamune wonders what they will use it for. The woman says, isn't it obvious that she uses this drug in order to erase the slave brand to him? Masamune asks if it can really be erased. The woman says that, of course. However, since the secret drug is usually used for other things, few people know about its effect. She tells him to listen to her carefully, and then says that the drug is a little painful, but he must definitely be patient. The girl says she can handle it. At her signal, he should apply healing to the wound. She doesn't count on him much, but the young man must conjure in full force. Masamune shudders and says that he understands everything. The woman drips a little on the girl's hand, and she starts screaming in pain. Sharon says it won't be for long, so the girl has to be patient. She starts pouring the potion on the girl's hand, and then shouts to Masamune that it's his turn to apply healing magic. The young man used healing and the burn on his hand disappeared. The girl was exhausted, so Masamune used magic to remove the effects. Then he leans over to her and asks if she's okay. The girl says she has no pain or dizziness, so she is fine. They pay attention to her elbow and see that everything is wiped clean there. Shara says it's amazing because it's a secret medicine made from basilisk fangs. She only knew that it strengthens the body. Sharon says that it is usually used as a strengthening potion. However, if you slightly increase the proportion of poison when mixing, then you can achieve this effect. The poison corrodes the skin and causes acute pain. 
In addition, if you make a mistake with the proportion of poison, then the skin can become petrified, so you need to be very careful. Just for insurance, if something goes wrong, then you need to apply healing. And also for additional insurance, she added an ingredient that neutralizes petrification. Massimune sees the very soft skin of him. Sharon turns to Massimune and says that he turns out to be very calm. She had never seen healing magic work so quickly before. Not to mention the fact that the young man was able to use the removal of effects. She didn't even know that this spell could relieve fatigue. Massimune doesn't look like he's capable of such a thing. Shira says it's also the first time she's seen this. It turns out that the young man not only studied the assignment of the attribute. The young man asked if it wasn't normal for a healer to be able to do this. Sharon says that where has it been seen that healers can use so many spells? Most healers can only use the healing spell available from the beginning. Although even it is not nearly as effective as a similar spell from the priests. Even more experienced healers only have a kinship with attribute assignment, and even this is already very rare. If a healer tries to learn new spells, he will only become a target for ridicule. Even if you give it all your strength, at best you will master healing and attribute assignment. That is why everyone considers and calls healers the weakest class. Massimune remembers Ares' face when she said those words. Sharon says it looks like Massimune is different. She asks if he knows any other spells. The young man says that, in principle, he can increase the attack and defense of allies. Sharon and Shara are very surprised by this. The girl asks if the spell Massimune is talking about is called the Aura of Hatred. The young man gives a positive answer. Sharon says that this magic belongs to a high level. She had never even heard of such healers. The young man asks what it is even though it is not attacking magic, but it still has a high level. Sharon replies that the gain from this spell is on a completely different level. In addition, since few people can use it, the value of such magic is higher. Massimune smiles and thinks that, of course, he still has the weakest class, but with high level magic, he still seems to feel better. After a while, in the Adventurer's Guild, the receptionist announced that the successful completion of the Basilisk neutralization mission was counted. She says she is also honored to announce that Mr. Nito has been promoted to the rank of B. She asks to accept her congratulations. Then the girl says that Mrs. Todorica has been promoted to the rank of S. Massimune asks her to wait and says that it must be some kind of mistake. He asks how he can get a B rank if only a few days ago he was an F rank, and a C rank Toa too. The girl says that there can be no mistake, because that was the decision of the head of the guild. Massimune turns to Shira and asks if this is really how they are promoted here. The girl says that it usually takes at least a year to move even to the next rank. In most cases, it's more like a few years. The higher the rank, the more difficult it becomes to get it. Massimune thinks that it would take at least four years to get from F rank to B rank, and he hasn't been here for a month yet. Shira says that she herself does not have complete information, but if Massimune wants, she can contact the head of the guild. The young man refuses and says that everything is fine. Then the receptionist turns to Shira and says that an award has been prepared, which she did not have time to receive earlier. She is asked to get acquainted, sign in the right place. Massimune realized that they were talking about a reward for Klein's nut. He even suggests that his promotion may also be related to this story. No other options come to his mind. However, he remembers that he registered with the guild as Nito, and Reinhardt should know him under the name Massimune. But on the other hand, Hilda knows that Nito is Massimune. The young man understands that he is in trouble. It seems that now at least the guild and the white royal knights know that Nito and Massimune are the same person. If this goes on, then there will soon be no sense in the pseudonym at all. Suddenly, the young man's thoughts are interrupted by a man. Massimune turns around and sees a familiar man who shouts that the young man is taking assignments here again. He asks if he really hasn't realized his uselessness yet. Shira says that Annette has just contacted her and told her that the girl is being called to the headquarters. The young man said that Shira could go because it would be all right here. They say goodbye to each other. The man starts screaming from being ignored again. He claims that he will not tolerate ridicule from garbage, which is only good for beating goblins. Nemu interrupts him and says that this man is evil and orders him to leave his master alone. The man asks what kind of little girl she is, and then tells the young man that he is with a new girl every time. He even says that for sure he does everything with her and does not disdain. The man apologizes to her and says that he has business with this healer. Suddenly, Nemu becomes enraged and, jumping up, uses the cat food skill, hitting the man. He flies to the other end of the guild. He says that he is a mean person who mocks the master, so let him taste the cat's fist. Witnesses called the man Eggy and said that he does not know how to drink at all. Massimune realized that this blow was the same cat's fist that Nemu was talking about. 
It's just like Sharon said, Nemu is much stronger than any healer. Masamune asks why Nemu didn't use the cat's fist when she was captured by traffickers of illegal substances. The girl replies that she did not control herself then. Toa says that, probably, she was given a breath of Manitabi or something similar. She also says that they had a maid from the cat race in the castle, and Toa heard that they get drunk from Matatabi. However, when they grow up, the effect becomes weaker and there are special trainings that allow them to better cope with the smell. Masamune asks if he had such training. The girl replies that she doesn't know. At that time, in Radhuizen Castle, Shira was standing at the front door and apologizing for the intrusion. In front of her was the assembly hall of the White Royal Knights. Shira apologizes for being late. A girl of the seventh rank, Shira Ekarat, from the White Royal Knights, came in. She was answered by a girl of the sixth rank, Emily Anderson. She told the girl not to worry, because they knew that Shara might be late, so they just got ready. A member of the White Royal Knights of the 4th rank, Raid Black, was also in this room. The man said that Shara probably went on a mission with that young man. A member of the White Royal Knights of the 3rd rank, Hilda Ekarat, asked Shira how her assignment went and whether she made friends with that white cat girl. A member of the White Royal Knights of the 2nd rank, Daniel King, said that everyone present should be quiet, because they do not allow Reinhardt to speak. Edward Scotch interrupts him and says that before moving on to the main topic, he would like to ask a question. Why not directly tell Shira that they are going to organize surveillance of the young man? It would be wrong to hide it. Shara is surprised. Daniel King says that this decision was made by His Majesty, and to check Massimune's motives, to begin with, he and Shira were sent to the Vic. The commander of the White Royal Knights of the first rank, Reinhard Rickman, says that the king knew from the very beginning what was going on there and therefore gave this task to Shira. But today's meeting is not because of this. Hilda asks Shira what's wrong with her, but the girl says that everything is fine. She, as a white knight, probably should have said that they invited Massimune, but the girl did not know how they would react to this. Reinhardt says that he will continue and announces the main theme of the meeting, saying that there, in Greyberg, a forbidden ritual of summoning heroes was held. After a while, everyone gathered at Shira's house to cook a barbecue. The girl's father was collecting firewood for the fire, and was glad that they had not rested together for a long time. The man said that when Shara and Hilda were little, they often fried meat, so it brings back memories to him. Massimune was laying out pieces of meat from a bag and said that there was a lot of meat here, so there was enough even for all the servants, so everyone could treat themselves to it. The man was thanking the young man, because, after all, there are only 15 maids in the estate. The young man replied that there should be enough meat. He pointed to the table where the Stein's meat was, which they received in gratitude for one of the missions, and they bought a pile of meat that was lying on the side separately. Massimune asked the man not to refuse, because it would be like their gratitude for all the work. The man thanked the young man, and then ordered the maid to call everyone to the table. Then the young man took out five bottles of alcohol in another barrel. He told the man to take this wine, because he has more. The man giggled and said that he himself owns a large vineyard, so he has a lot of strong drinks and different types. He takes a bottle of wine and just screams in horror that he is holding an old gel in his hands. Suddenly Nemu appears and says that Shara and Hilda have come. After a while, everyone enjoyed meat and expensive wine. Even the cook burst into tears from what the old geld is trying in his life. Massimune watches everyone and is happy about it. Then Toa comes up to him and says that it's very good when everyone is happy. Then the girl asks something about Shira and says that she is clearly not okay. He looks at the girl sitting alone and says that he sees it perfectly. Soon he comes up to her and asks permission to sit down next to her. He sits down and asks what happened to the girl. Shira asks if Massimune has ever heard anything about summoning heroes. The young man was surprised and then replied that he had heard of such a thing. The girl asks if the young man really knows the reason why this ritual is considered forbidden. Massimune replies that he knows about human sacrifice. The girl wonders why he is so calm. Today, for the first time, she heard about the ritual and about the victims and tortures accompanying it. Massimune is surprised by this and asks what kind of torture is this. After a while, Shira tells him the whole truth about the ritual and says that she had no idea that such magic existed. However, she thinks that as a royal white knight, she should have been prepared to face the truth that she would prefer not to notice, but now magic scares her a little. The young man asks if this is not normal. Not all magic is associated with victims. He doesn't think Shara should worry about it. There will always be enough good and terrible people. There will always be both protective magic and forbidden magic. He thinks it all depends on the person using this magic. And if it's still hard for a girl, then he will always listen to her, just like now. 
he also says that Shira has Toa, Nemu and Hilda, so Shira should talk until she feels better, and the young man will be there. The girl can't stand it and hugs the young man. She asks to be called simply Shira and not to use any more formalities, because they are close friends. So the girl asks permission to call the young man just Masamun. Suddenly, she shouts at him from the side and says that it's not fair, and then runs screaming straight to Shira and Masamune, asking what the girl is doing with her master. The girl looks contemptuously at Shira and says that she is acting dishonestly, because only she hugged Masamune. Shira shouts and says that no one is sticking to anyone. Nemu says that they just hugged and Nemu saw everything. Suddenly Toa comes up to them and says that it looks like Shira has already recovered. The girl apologizes for making everyone worry. Masamune explains to him that Shira needed to speak out, so she didn't do anything strange. Nemu says that they also agreed to switch to non-formal communication. After a while, the Toa also told about the summoning of the heroes. The girl was surprised that, it turns out, there is such magic. Masamune asks if she really didn't know about it. Toa replied that this was the first time she had heard about it. Then Masamune says that it was a ritual of summoning heroes. Shira says she thinks everyone will find out about it soon anyway. It looks like the Kingdom of Greyberg has performed this forbidden ritual. Shira sees Masamune's reaction and says that, did he really know about Greyberg? She also says that he has never been surprised all the time and probably he knew something for sure. The young man says that he learned this from the dragon's heart. They told him when they went there that they were going to investigate the summoning of heroes in Greyberg. Shira asks if it's really just that. The young man understands that the girl may have noticed everything. There have been many cases that are difficult to explain. Apparently, so much has accumulated that it will not be possible to get out of it. Masamune says he will tell them everything. With regard to these summoned heroes, he admits that he is one of them. A pause of silence surrounds everyone. The young man realizes that this is not the reaction he expected. Then he says in a hurry that he was called from another world. Toa thinks about it. Shira rubs her chin and says she doesn't know how to react to it properly. At least it explains all those cases with Masamune. She explains that the young man did not know much about this world, and most importantly, that for the healer class, Masamune's strength is completely atypical. Raid Black talks about the blessing that heroes are endowed with. Masamune interrupts them and asks them to let him clarify something. He was called here as a hero, but he is not a hero at all. Shira asks in what sense the young man says this. He says with an emotionless face that he was thrown out because he is a healer, but he thinks it's for the best because he was able to meet all of them. Nemu asks if it is good that the master met with him, to which the young man replies that he is sure that it is very good. Shira asks everyone to stop and asks what it means that there are other conscripts besides him. The young man replies that it is. If the kingdom threw Masamune out, then are the other guys even stronger. Masamune replies that he has heard that everyone has elite classes, so most likely they are strong. Shara is surprised by this. Toa interrupts them and says that they cannot be stronger than Masamune. Shira asks why. The young man remembers something and says that Shira and Nemu did not see his real status. He activates his status panel, and Sheru and him are just surprised that the young man has a three-digit level. The girl understands that it is really hard to believe that someone can be even stronger. She asks that maybe Nido's pseudonym is also connected with the call. Masamune gives a positive answer. The young man says that he uses his pseudonym because he does not want other conscripts to know that he survived. 